In this video, we're going to go over what exactly is Microsoft Excel. So how does this work? You know, what is it really used for? And what are the different things you can do? And why is it important to organization? That's what we're going to cover in this particular lesson. So let's go ahead and jump into what exactly is Microsoft Excel. So Microsoft Excel is a powerful spreadsheet program that allows you to store, organize, manipulate, and analyze information, right? So as you can see there on the right hand side with Excel, you can create a variety of different data visualizations. You're able to analyze information. You're able to manipulate it, organize it, and be able to present it in a very unique and helpful manner. That's essentially what Excel is. It's really about being able to utilize the tool to create different data visualizations, manipulate the data, and essentially be able to showcase information based off data that is being gathered. And so it's a spreadsheet program which contains a number of columns and rows where each intersection of a column and a row is a cell. So if you look at the right hand side there, you see the different boxes, you see the different you know, sections there. You have the, you know, columns that are vertical. You have the rows which are horizontal, right? And that is essentially what is the, you know, known as the cell there when they're intersecting. And then each cell contains one point of data or info. And by organizing the data in this particular manner, you can make information easier to find and automatically draw information from changing data. So you can create a variety of different shortcuts, different types of formulas, that will allow you to add up information. You know, let's say for example, you are looking at, you know, your budget and you're looking to see how much you spent, you know, within a given month and you're adding up all your different expenses. Well, there's different shortcuts and formulas that you can use to be able to add in all the information based off the criteria that you put on Excel and have it automatically added up all for you and give you the actual number as far as this is how much was spent, you know, in this month this is how much was spent from this category. And so all of these different things you're able to do, right? Store the data, manipulate it, analyze it, and look at, you know, where everything is coming from and look at the total amount. And so just think about the power of this in the, you know, business setting where businesses, organizations have, you know, thousands and thousands of data types of information where they're looking to see how they can analyze the data, be able to make better use of it, and be able to make sure that it's presented in a way where they can make better business decisions. And then whether you're keeping a budget, organizing a training log, or creating an invoice, Excel makes it easy to work with different types of data, right? We just went over the example of a personal budget where you are looking to find out how much you've spent within a given month, where that spending is coming from, and then also how much you spent within each category and then all together as a total. Because of the power of the tool and what you're able to do within Excel, it's one of the most used software applications of all times. Hundreds of millions of people around the world use Microsoft Excel. And like I said, it's just pretty much one of those deals where you can use this tool to be able to look at information and be able to make objective decisions based off the information. And so uh, there's just so much you can do here. You know, this can be, you know, a 10, 20, 30 minute lesson here, but I really just want to give you a foundational understanding of what we're looking to do here within Microsoft Excel. And really, like I said, ultimately, it allows you to store, organize, manipulate, and analyze information. And that's exactly what you're going to learn how to do in this particular course, right? So that you can take these skills and be able to develop your, you know, knowledge, your skill set, and be able to go out there and land a job or get started freelancing, which you're also going to learn how to do in this course. So that's going to be here for this one, and we'll see you on the next one. In this video, we're going to go over who exactly this course is for. We're going to go over here specifically, you know, who this course is going to be the best suited for, who this is going to be, you know, best for as far as getting the most out of this particular lesson here. And ultimately, regardless of your experience, you're going to be able to get quite a bit from this course, whether you are somebody who's a beginner and has no prior knowledge or experience, you're probably going to learn the most from this course, right? And this is really what's really going to allow you to get you a full understanding of Excel from A to Z versus somebody who also has a little bit of experience, maybe is a little bit more intermediate, 
you're also going to be able to learn quite a bit in this course but really this course is for all levels anyone who is looking to learn excel from scratch from a to z or somebody who already has some experience and wants to take their game to the next level so let's go ahead and jump into who this course is for and so essentially this course is for students and working professionals that want to learn excel and become an expert with the program and so just like i mentioned whether or not you have some experience or you're a total newbie you're going to be able to benefit from this course and be able to come away from this course as a full-blown expert with the program if you're an excel beginner or even intermediate and want to learn excel then this course is the perfect place for you to start right because we take you from a to z in terms of excel as a beginner learning how to actually even start the program up you know what all the functions do to being able to create several different complex formulas using different tips different shortcuts that are going to make you a complete total expert with excel so this course is going to allow you to be able to hone in on your skills if you already have some experience or go from a complete beginner to an expert if you're just starting out and this course not only walks you through excel from a to z but we also show you how to land a job and get started with freelancing I'm sure if you've seen all the other courses out there that you've taken, you know, probably in the past in terms of Excel or, you know, whatever the topic may be, very few of them will actually show you and walk you through how to get a job, how to land a job in the marketplace, and then also how to get started with freelancing and client consulting because they're just teaching you how to hone in on the skills. But we take this a step further and show you how to be able to build a career, right? Get your career started after you develop these skills because if you have a skill set but nobody knows about you nobody knows you know what you're capable of and you're just you know pretty much not getting your name out there then how are you going to be able to leverage these skills and be able to profit and benefit from them so we show you exactly how to do that and like i mentioned whether you're a total newbie with no prior knowledge or experience or if you already have some intermediate experience this course blends practical work with solid theoretical training and takes you from the basics of Microsoft Excel all the way through to mastery. So regardless of where you're coming from or what your experience level is, you're going to be able to benefit from this course and be able to ultimately land a job or get started freelancing. So we're excited for you to get started here and we'll see you on the next one. In this video, we're going to walk through the Microsoft Excel marketplace. So what we're really going to go over here is looking at the marketplace as a whole as far as excel as far as the growth potential and really just giving you an overview of how much in demand your skills are going to be after you go through this course so let's go ahead and jump into the microsoft excel marketplace okay so forrester research found that 81 percent of businesses use excel and honestly i'm not really sure what the data points were as far as the stats in terms of being able to come up with 81% because I would say it's more than that because businesses need to be able to have some sort of tracking mechanism to be able to keep track of their you know expenses their their data points right as far as you know leads and sales and customers and all this other stuff that is important to be able to track so I would even say it's a bit more I don't know where the you know data points or metrics that they were going off of but I would say the majority of businesses are using Excel and these skills are very marketable to employers right that's why you're going through this course because you're learning how to be able to become an Excel expert and once you go through this course your skills are going to be highly marketable to the employers and we're going to show you how to be able to position yourself as the go-to expert in your field and how to set yourself apart from the competition and so Excel is used by an estimated 750 million people worldwide that's a significant amount of people right because like I said pretty much in business the majority of them are using this all the time and like I mentioned it's got to be more than 81 percent because businesses have all different types of data and they have to be able to you know store it in a particular place manipulate it and be able to analyze it accordingly so it's got to be more than that 81 percent like I said because for me it seems like every single business out there unless they're using like a pen and paper and using you know what they used to do back in the day 
and then on average certified excel skills can increase your earnings potential by 12 percent so if you are somebody who's in a particular position right now and you are developing your excel skills then this could increase your earnings potential by 12 percent so that's a pretty significant amount there and then the excel skills open the door to more jobs and careers especially for individuals that don't have a college degree that's a big thing there as well you know as far as being able to get a job out there and being able to you know get known and seen for your skills a lot of companies out there will be looking for that college degree but i think now in today's digital age the college degree really isn't that important now what they're looking at is your experience and what you're able to do and bring to the table as far as outside the box right are you somebody who is just has experience with the resume and a college degree or do you have experience do you have a resume and you may not have a college degree but you have a social media presence you have an online personal brand you have a website right we show you how to do all of that in this course and that will allow you to set yourself apart in the marketplace in terms of the competition so that even if you don't have a college degree you'll still be able to be you know at the top of list with the candidates and then according to LinkedIn, data analysts, which work in Excel pretty much all day, all the time, are one of the top 10 most in-demand jobs. So with you learning all these different skills within Excel, there's a lot of different job roles that you can get into. And we're going to go into that in another lesson. However, for the most part, data analytics is what you're going to be really working within and focused on. And the data analyst job is the top 10 most in-demand jobs based on LinkedIn. So as you can see here, there's just huge potential, huge growth, huge demand, and it's only going to be increasing, you know, with the years to come. So that's going to be here for this lesson, and we'll see you on the next one. In this video, we're going to go over the Excel job opportunity. So we're going to cover some of the top jobs that require Excel skills. We're going to give you some average type of experience level that you need we're going to give you some potential salary numbers here of what you can expect as somebody who's entry level or somebody who already has some experience and just pretty much giving you an overview of the opportunities that are available for individuals that have the skill set of excel they've mastered it which you're going to be able to do by going through this course so let's go ahead and jump into excel job opportunities okay so entry level data analyst with less than one year experience, which is pretty much going to be the job that you're looking at or looking to get into after you complete this course, you can expect to earn an average of 52,000. And then one to four years experience can earn you an average of 56,000. And then five to nine years experience can earn you an average salary of 63,000. And then obviously here, a very senior level can get you, you know, 66,000 plus, but this is just a data analyst type of positions, right? That's depending on, you know, really what you're looking to get into. If you're looking to stay within the data analyst world or you're looking to get into maybe business analysis, maybe you want to look at becoming a project manager, whatever that may be, right? This is just kind of giving you an overview of the data analyst position. And a recent study from Indeed.com was looking at what is the most in-demand software skills in the market. And they found that Excel came out on top. So Excel is very much so in demand. You know, the skills for, you know, Excel are just going to continue to increase. There's just so many opportunities out there that are available and that are coming up, especially with data increasing, right? So they're just massive opportunity. And then also here we're looking at the list of jobs that require Excel skills. So we have the data analyst, we have accountants, admin assistants, business analysts, project managers, and really the list can go on and on because in most type of office setting jobs where you're doing data entry, you're working with data, with information, it's going to require you to have a fundamental understanding of Excel because you're going to be working with data, analyzing, and then making decisions based off that data. So there's just a massive opportunity here for you to be able to come in here, learn these skills by going through this course and land a high paying job or get started with freelancing. So that's gonna be here for this one and we'll see you on the next one. In this video, we're gonna go over some of the top Excel jobs that you can expect to get if you're looking to really master your skills in Excel, which I'm assuming you're doing that by going through this course, right? You're looking to 
go from a complete beginner to expert or if you already have the experience right you're looking to take your game to the next level so what we're going to do here is really go over what some of the top most common jobs are and what the experience level is and what you're going to be responsible for in your particular job role as a particular data analyst so let's go ahead and jump into the excel job types okay and so like i said in one of the other videos a data analyst is what you're typically going to be going for if you're just starting out or maybe even if you already have some experience right and you're taking your excel game to the next level you're going to be able to easily get these types of roles because these individuals are some of the most sought after professionals in the world and because the demand is so strong and the supply of people who can truly do this job well is so limited data analysts command high salary so you can oftentimes be able to get a lot more than the average because you are a complete from a to z expert in excel you understand how to use the tool you understand how to you know analyze the data how to be able to present it right and so this is something that is extremely valuable in today's marketplace and you're really just going to be working within data obviously if you're a data analyst and essentially they take data and probe it to spot trends make forecasts and extract information to help their employers make better informed business decisions so that's really what you're looking to do as a data analyst you look at different trends make various predictions various forecasts based on the previous data quick example of this would be looking at the data in the sales of previous years you know revenue from a company and then this year you're looking at the projections and the forecast right all of that is going to be within excel and you're going to be able to easily do that through after going through this course and then you're extracting the information and you're helping them make better informed decisions that will ultimately increase the bottom line and so some of the lists of the common responsibilities here are going to be to interpret data and provide ongoing reports, develop and implement databases, collect and work with data analytics and other strategies that optimize statistical efficiency, quality, and then also identify, analyze, and interpret key trends or patterns in complex data sets, right? This is probably one of the most important things here is being able to take all these different data sets, right, that you're getting from the company, from your you know employer whatever that may be and analyzing it and looking at different opportunities right strengths weaknesses opportunities threats and so utilizing the SWOT analysis to be able to help you better understand and give recommendations to your organization to your employer right to your clients whatever that may be so some of the top actual positions here that you're going to see in the excel field is the data analyst financial analyst business analyst typically the financial analysts actually are people that work either like on wall street or in private equity firms where they're just analyzing you know businesses or analyzing you know p l statements you know profit and loss and things of that nature and then business analysts you're pretty much analyzing the business as a whole admin assets admin assistants accountants bookkeepers project managers and pretty much anything that has to do with analytics and so these are the various job opportunities that you can see within the marketplace after you you know have gone through this course and developed and mastered your excel skills so that's going to be here for this one and we'll see you on the next one all right first things first before we actually begin working inside of excel we need to learn how to open up the application first now, some of you may already have the Excel shortcut placed on your desktop. If you do, you can go ahead and give that a double click, which will open up the application. If you don't see the shortcut, what you want to do is go down to the bottom left corner of your screen and click the Start button. Now, my Start menu may look a little different than yours, depending on what kind of operating system you're on. Currently, I'm on Windows 10, so my Start menu looks like this. Now, if we scroll down to the letter E, we can open Excel from here, or we can search for it in the search bar, and we can open Excel this way. All right, now that we have Excel open, we are introduced by the start screen. Now, your start screen may look a little different than mine, depending on the version of Excel you have. In the next video, we will learn how to determine what version of Excel you're working with and discuss a little bit more about what the start screen consists of. Okay, now that we are in the Excel start screen, I did mention in the previous video that your start screen may or may not look different than mine, depending on what version you have. So to check or determine what version of Excel you're working with, 
what you need to do is go down to the bottom left corner of your screen and click account. Now this will give you all the info about your account, but the button that we want to focus on is this one right here, about Excel. Give that a click and here at the top in green bold letters, you can tell that I'm running Microsoft Excel 365 64 bit. This is actually a pretty important piece of information to know how to find because down the road you might have to install a third party program to Excel and you might be prompt with a question asking you what version of Excel are you running and you can come here to figure that out. Keep in mind that some features in the newer Excel versions are not compatible with the older Excel versions. So if you're ever working with someone it might be a good idea to ask them hey what version of Excel are you running? And they might say, uh, I don't know. And you can guide them here to figure that out. So you don't want to go into the project thinking you can do something and then later find out, oh, their version of Excel doesn't support this feature. Okay, now that we learned how to determine what version of Excel we are running, I'm going to give you a little walkthrough of what the start screen consists of, which is the home tab, the new tab, and the open tab. Here in the home tab, we can open up a blank workbook, which is what you would do if you start a brand new project. And then also Microsoft provides us with, you know, a little Excel tour, some tutorials, some predefined templates. Now down here, you will see all the recent workbooks that you previously opened on the pen tab is the ones that you manually pinned. So if it's an important file or a file that you work with a lot, you would pin it to here so you can easily get to it. And then the shared with me is any projects that get shared with you. Now for the new tab. The new tab, once again, you can see that there is a blank workbook if you want to start a brand new project. Now down here in the office tab are all these predefined templates Microsoft has provided us. As you can tell, there's some calendar templates, weekly time sheets. And then you can also search for, let's say you want a quote template, you can search for a quote. And as you can tell, there's a construction proposal, business price quote, and a few other quotes. So that's pretty neat. And then on the personal tab are going to be all the templates that you save. We'll get to this later in the course where I'll show you how we can make our own templates. And this is where they will be saved. And then the last tab is the open tab. Once again, you'll see your recent files that you previously worked on. And this is where you can start to browse your PC to look for files you want to work on. For example, if you click this PC, you can go through here or you can click browse and open up the original file explorer that you're probably used to. So what we're going to start with is new in a blank workbook. And in the next video, I'll explain a little bit about the Excel interface. Okay, now that we've created a brand new Excel workbook, this is the screen that we are presented with. And everything you see within this screen is called the Excel interface. Now there's multiple sections of the Excel interface. So in this video, I'm going to be giving you a little walkthrough of what each section does and what they consist of. The first section we're going to be talking about is called the Quick Access Toolbar, which is located at the very top left corner of your screen. Now what this toolbar consists of is frequently used commands and by default we have auto save, save, undo, redo, and touch and mouse mode. Touch and mouse mode is actually really useful if you're working in Excel like on a tablet because since the screen is smaller and using your fingers sometimes it's hard to click all these commands that are very condensed together. So if we activate the touch mode you can see how the commands are a lot more spread apart and it's just a little cleaner style. Now since we're working on a PC, I'm going to go back to mouse mode. Next we're going to be talking about the Excel ribbon, which is located at the top of your screen and extends all the way across. Now within this ribbon are many different tabs, some that you may not see such as the developer tab and the power pivot tab because we haven't activated them yet, but we'll get there later in the course. And within the tabs are command groups. And they are separated by these little lines. So you have the clipboard group, font group, alignment group, and so on. And within these groups are the command buttons for that group. So in the font group, we have the bold command, italicized command, underline command, and so on. And if we click this little arrow in the bottom right, this opens up the dialog launcher, which has even more commands related to the font group. But since the ribbon only has so much space, Microsoft did a good job at organizing and placing the most frequently used commands within these groups. 
And now next we're going to be talking about the formula bar, which is located between your ribbon and the cells of the worksheet. And this is where we're going to be entering formulas later in the course. And right to the left of it is called the name box, which shows the name of the active cell that you have selected. So right now it shows A1 because we've selected A1. Now if I select A2, now the name box shows A2. Now there's just one more quick tip I wanted to share with you is that the ribbon can take up quite a bit of space. So if you double click on one of the tabs, it will minimize the ribbon. And this could actually happen to you accidentally. And you're like, whoa, where did my ribbon go? All you have to do is just double click the tab and it's back to normal. All right, just a little bit more about the Excel interface. Down at the bottom right hand corner of your screen, this little area is called the status bar. And within the status bar, we can select different views. So right now we are currently in the normal view, or we can select the page layout view or the page break view. Now these views can also be accessed underneath the view tab and we can go back to our normal view. Also down here, we have a little zoom bar that we can zoom in and zoom out of our spreadsheet. And lastly, the status bar displays various information about our Excel spreadsheet. For example, Let's say we want to put in some numbers here in the cell. So we're going to put in 15, 10, 5, and 30. Okay. Well, if we select these cells and come down here, our status bar automatically calculates the average, which is 15. And we have select four cells, so it counts the number of cells we've selected. And it sums the cells that we selected. So adding all those together is 60. We can also customize the status bar to show even more info by right clicking. And let's say we want to put the minimum and maximum down on our status bar. So now within our selected cells, it also calculates the minimum, which is five and the maximum, which is 30. In this video, I'm going to be explaining some of the key differences between an Excel workbook and an Excel worksheet, a workbook consists of multiple worksheets. So right now at the very top, we are in book one. This is our Excel workbook. Now down here at the bottom, there's only one sheet. Later in the course, we'll discuss how to add sheets a little bit more in detail. But for now, just really quickly, I'm going to add a few more sheets by clicking this plus sign. Now I have three sheets that live inside this one workbook. The Excel worksheet is consisted of rows and columns. So we have the row numbers here on our left, one, two, three, four, all the way down, and the columns, A, B, C, D, and all the way to the right. To get to the very bottom row, we are going to use a shortcut key, which is control down arrow. And if you're on the Mac, I believe it's command down arrow. And throughout the course, I'll try my best to anytime we use a shortcut key, I will also provide the Mac version as well. But right now I'm on Windows, so I'm going to press Control down arrow. And as you can tell, there are 1,048,576 rows. And now to get back to the very top, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to press Control up arrow. And if you're on Mac, it's Command up arrow. To get to the very last column, all the way to the right, we're going to be using kind of the same shortcut, which is Control right arrow. Now I know there's not a number, but XFD is equivalent to 16,384 columns. So if we do the math, that means there are over 17 billion cells in a single worksheet, which is kind of crazy. As for how many worksheets you can have in a single workbook, there is no limit. It's all based on how much memory your computer can handle. Now, earlier versions of Excel, there was a limit of only 255 worksheets. So I would strongly recommend staying beneath that because the more worksheets you have in a workbook, the slower the application will run. All right, currently we have an Excel workbook open. Now we haven't saved it yet. So when you're saving a workbook for the first time, what we want to do is go to the file tab and click save as. Now from here, we need to choose a location where we want to store this file on our computer. You can click browse and search for a location there, or you can click this PC. And right now it says that we're saving it under my documents. I could click this and change the location if I wanted to, but as of right now, documents will do just fine. Now, right underneath that, we need to give it a name. 
uh, for this example, I'm just going to call it test save. And right below that is the file extension. Now by default, Excel saves it as a .xlsx file, which means it's just a plain old simple Excel workbook. But if we click this drop down, there's a number of different file types that we can choose from. Now really quickly, I just want to point out a few commonly used file types that you will probably see, which is a macro and enable workbook, Excel template, a text file, a .csv file, which is short for comma delimited, and a PDF file. Now later in the course, we'll discuss more of these in detail. But for this video, I just wanted to show you all the different file types and how to save and change the file type if needed. But for this example, we're just going to stick with the .xlsx. So you can click out of that and we can click save. All right. So you can see at the top that the book one has changed to test save, which is the name of our workbook. So if we close out of this, go to my documents right here we should see that test saves right here at the very bottom and we can open that back up and it'll take us to our workbook. Now that we have our test save workbook open, I'm going to make a few changes in the cells and then save over what we already have. So if let's just say I put hi and hello in these cells. Now if I click save right here in our quick access toolbar or I can go file save, that means we've saved all the changes that we just made and next time we open this file these changes will be here. So really quickly I'm going to close Excel, open up test save back up and our changes are still there. Let's say you want to make a few changes to this workbook but you don't want to overwrite the original workbook. So for example I'm just going to put in a 1 and a 2 in these cells. Now I'm going to go back to the file save as option, not save because that will save over my original document, I'm going to go to test save 2 and click enter and close out of Excel. So now in my documents I have test save and test save 2. So if I open up test save 2 it will have all the changes that I previously made and if I open up test save the original one it's only going to have the hi and hello. Also, if you didn't notice during that process, we can open up Excel documents straight from the file location by giving a double click, or we can go to file, open, and then choose one of the files that we have in our recent folder, or go actually browse your PC under documents and open up the file from here. Now that we've discussed what the Excel interface is and what it consists of, I'm going to go in and talk about how we can actually customize it. So for starters, I'm going to show you how to customize the quick access toolbar. There's three different ways to do this. I will show you all three just so that you get a little bit more familiar of how to add commands to your quick access toolbar. Now the first way, we can click this drop down menu. Now these are just a few commands that we can easily access. For example, if you do a lot of printing, put quick print up here. As you can tell, a printer icon appeared. So anytime we want to print, all we have to do is click that icon. Now another option to do is anywhere in your ribbon, let's say if we go to the data tab, you can right click any command. For example, I'm going to click the highest to lowest sort command. I'm going to right click it and click add to quick access toolbar. Now you can see that icon popped up there. And then the last way is go to file, options, quick access toolbar, now you have a list of all the commands that Excel has. Right now we're viewing popular commands that are most frequently used or you can drop down and go to all commands and this will show you all the commands Excel has and you can add anything up there to that quick access toolbar. But for now I'm just going to go to popular and maybe put sum and then click add. And when I click OK, now the sum command is up there in the quick access toolbar. Being able to customize the Excel interface can actually save you a lot of time depending on your workflow. So instead of going through the tabs and finding the commands, you can just put it right up there in the quick access toolbar for easy access. Now if you want to remove these commands up here, there's a few ways. I'll show you both. You can either right click and say remove from quick access toolbar or you can go to file, options, quick access toolbar, 
and click on one of the commands that you want to remove. For example, I'm going to click sort descending, remove, quick print, remove, and click OK. Now our quick access toolbar is back to default. All right, now that we've learned how to customize the quick access toolbar, we're going to go over how we can actually customize the Excel ribbon, meaning that we can add groups, commands, and tabs on the Excel ribbon. What we want to do is go to File, Options, Customize Ribbon, and here's where we can add new groups and new tabs to the ribbon. So first off, we're just going to add a new group to the Home tab. So if we click Home right here and click New Group, and we can rename the group by clicking rename and we'll just call it test group and click OK. Now you can see that we have a test group here in our home tab. As of right now we don't have any commands in this group. If you want to see the commands for example if I click font this plus button these are all the commands within that group. So now let's add a command to our new group. I'm going to come over here under popular commands and maybe add an email to our new group. So I'm going to click email and click add. So now you can see that the email command is underneath our test group. I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. And if you notice, if we go to our Excel ribbon all the way to the right underneath our home tab, we have the test group, which is the name, and then the email command. This is actually pretty neat. Even though Microsoft does a great job at organizing the commands into groups, but depending on what your workflow is, you can add groups and add commands. Just it's a little extra personalization that you can do to the Excel ribbon. Now let's add a new tab to our Excel ribbon. So if we go to File, Options, Customize Ribbon, and then we can click New Tab. And we can go ahead and rename the tab as well. We're going to name it Test Tab. Click OK. And as of right now, we don't have any groups. What I'm going to do is just pull this test group into the tab group. So I'm taking it off the home tab and putting it into the test tab. And within the test group, we still have our email command. So I'm going to click OK. Now on our home tab, the email command, as you can see, has disappeared. But if you look right here, we have test tab. And now if we click that, our group and email command is there. So you can have a whole tab that is full with groups and commands that are specific to your needs. Now if you want to reorder this test tab and maybe move it to the end, you want to go to File, Options, Customize Ribbon, and we can move the test tab all the way down here to the bottom because these are in order and click OK. So now you can see that the test tab is at the very end. Now to remove the tabs and groups, all you need to do is go back to your File, Options, Customize Ribbon and we can click on our group and we can say remove we can also come back to our tab and click remove and just click OK so now we don't have the test tab here anymore or the test group with the email command okay so before we move into the next section of this course I want to point out Excel shortcut keys because once we start working inside of Excel we actually might be using some of these shortcut keys now depending if you're on Windows or Mac or a full keyboard versus a laptop keyboard your shortcut keys may be a little different than mine but in the resource tab if you click this link it'll take you to the Microsoft support Excel shortcut keys if you go to the Windows tab it will give you all the Excel shortcut keys for Windows same thing for the Mac if you scroll down it will give you a list of all the shortcut keys related to the Mac keyboard now throughout the course Anytime I'll use a shortcut key, I'll give you the Windows version and the Mac version. Trust me, no one is expected to remember all these shortcuts because everyone's needs are different. The shortcuts that you use often might be a little different than the ones that I primarily use. The fact is, the more shortcuts you use and try to remember, it will help you save a lot of time and help you become more efficient in Excel. The only way to start remembering these shortcuts is to actually practice them. So anytime there is a shortcut available to use, do it. And over time, once you keep on doing these shortcuts, it will become natural to you. So you know that Control C is copy, Control V is paste. Control Z, as in zebra, is undo. And throughout the course, you'll see more shortcuts that we'll use. And I'm not going to go crazy with them, but I will show you some of the ones that I found really useful, which might be very useful to you as well. All right, well, without further ado, let's get into the next section of this course. 
Okay, now that we've covered how to open up Excel, save a workbook, get familiar with the Excel interface, customizing the Excel ribbon quick access toolbar, it's time to start inputting data into the cells of the worksheet. Now for this example, we're going to be building a monthly expense report, and we're going to be building off this report for the next several videos. And we're going to be adding formulas, formatting, charts, and graphs to it to make it look all clean and organized and function properly as well. So for this video, all we're going to be doing is entering text values to create labels inside of Excel. Labels are actually very important, especially when we start importing tables and charts, because Excel needs to realize, oh, what do these numbers mean underneath these labels? So the first thing we're going to do is enter a title for the spreadsheet. So all we're going to have to do is click cell A1 and start typing monthly expenses and go ahead and click enter. The reason why we want to have a title is because it's not just for yourself, but it's also for other people because it helps people understand your workings and like, oh, well, if I come here, obviously this is going to be monthly expenses. So underneath the title, we're going to go ahead and skip a, skip a row here. And so in cell A3, I'm just going to abbreviate expenses as EXP. And now we're going to start listing some of the expenses. So in a company, you might have cost of goods sold, wages, rents, supplies, utilities, and that should be good for now. So in the column headings, we're going to put some months because this is a monthly expense report. So we're going to put January, February, and March. So I think we're good here for the basic setup. But like I said before, having Excel labels such as column headings and row labels is very important because not only does it tell the users what the values actually mean, but it also plays a big part when you're inserting charts and graphs because it wouldn't really make sense to have a bar chart with a bunch of bars with numbers on it, but you can't tell what it is because it doesn't have the labels. So right here, I think we're at a good stopping point. And in the next video, we're going to start adding numeric values into these cells. All right, now that we've got our column labels and row labels all set up, it's time to start putting numeric data into this expense report. So the first cell that we're going to be putting a numeric value in is the cost of goods sold for January, which is cell B4. So go ahead and click inside that cell. And let's just say that cost of goods sold was $1,000 for January. Now before I click enter, see if you catch the difference between entering a numeric value versus a text value like we did for the column labels and row labels. So if I click enter, you can see that the number is right aligned. What this means is that Excel automatically knows that we entered a numeric value. And the reason why Excel right aligns numeric values is because it helps with decimal places. So for example, if I change this to $1,000.58 and right below that for wages, I put $527. You could tell that the decimals line up and it's a nice clean look. Now if I select these cells by just clicking and then dragging over the cells to select them and change them to left align, you could tell that I'm getting like a little snake figure action where it's kind of hard to read the numbers because the decimals don't line up. So to undo that, I'm just going to click the undo button, which is also control Z if you're on Windows or command Z if you're on Mac. So control Z. Now we're back to a nice cleaner look. Now I'm going to change these figures back to a non-decimal figures. So $1,000 for a cost of goods sold in January. And I'll put $500 for wages for January. Rent was seven fifty, supplies one twenty five, and utilities was eighty. Okay, and I'm going to click tab to go over to the cell to the right, and I'm just going to click on the up arrow key to go back up to February. Now let's say cost of goods sold in February was eight fifty, wages stayed the same five hundred, rent stayed the same seven fifty. Supplies, let's say $100 of supplies and utilities went up by $40, so $120. So I'm going to click the Enter key, and that just brought me down a cell. So I'm going to 
click the right arrow and go back up using the up arrow to March and cost of goods sold let's say 900 wages once again the same rent the same supplies went up even more and utilities went down a little bit so 95 okay well I think we're at a good stopping point for this video since we got all of our numeric values entered in for all of our expenses and for each month I just wanted to point out the difference between entering numeric values versus text values because down the road when we actually start using these values inside of our formulas it's important that they are formatted correctly because if we try to sum a text value with a numeric value we're gonna get an error which we'll learn a little bit later in the course but for now I think we're all set and in the next video we'll discuss how to format these values correctly to give us a little bit more information about what these values actually mean okay so in this video we are going to be talking about how to format date values currently in our column headings we have January February March and as of right now these are text values to change these text values to date values we need to insert a date in a date format so Excel knows that we are trying to have a date value instead of a text value so we're going to click in cell B3 in the January column and type 1 slash 1 slash 20. You might have noticed that this cell went from left align to right align. So when we just had January in there, it was left. And when we put the date value in there, it goes back to right. That is because Excel treats date values as a number. Now that we've got a date value in the cell, we need to apply a little bit of formatting to make it look a little bit cleaner. So what we need to do is make sure to have the cell selected, go to the Home tab, up to the Numbers group, and click this drop down. This is where you apply value formatting. So as of right now, even though we have a date value in there, if we choose number, the date value number is 43831. Like I said before, Excel treats date values as numbers. But since we're dealing with dates, we have a short date, long date. That's not what we're really looking for. We're looking for that three letter month and then maybe a dash and the year. So if we go to more number formats down below and we click date in the category group. Now over here to the right underneath type, these are all the predefined date formats that Excel gives us. And if we select one of these up here in our sample box, it will show what our value in the cell would look like. And right now we are trying to find that three letter month dash and the year. So we got to find one that looks very similar to that, uh, which is this March dash 12th one right here. If we click it, we can tell in our sample that it's January dash 20. Now that could be January 20th or January of 2020. So if you want to change this to a four figure year, all we have to do is go down to the custom format. So up here in type, this is the format that is currently in place. But we can kind of use this to our advantage to see what it's doing and then customize it to our liking. Right now we see the three M's, which is the month, MMM-YY, which is the year. So we can kind of go off this and change it to how we want it, which is going to be MMM-YYYYY. And you can tell in our sample box, it is January-2020. And we can go ahead and click OK. And now you can see that in our cell, we have the correct format that we want. Now we can go through that whole process and do that for each column heading, but that might take a little bit of time. So I'm gonna show you a little Excel shortcut here. You wanna click in the cell that has the formatting, and you wanna drag your cursor to the bottom right corner of the cell until your cursor turns into a little thin black cross instead of a big thick white cross and what you want to do is click and drag over the column headings and as you can tell in that little white box that pops up underneath it is showing what the value will look like so if I extend it all the way to March and let go now all of our column headings have the correct format what we just use is called the fill handle now the fill handle is great for copying formatting copying cells, and picking up patterns, which is what Excel just did. It realized that we started with a January, a date value, and extended it across 
to the next month, February, and then March. For example, if I put just a one in this cell real quick and I click it and use the fill handle, it's just going to put one, 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 and so on because it's not picking up any patterns. But if I delete those and type in one, two, and three and select those cells, now if I use the fill handle and drag it down, Excel is picking up that there is a pattern. So it's picking up like, oh, I want to go one, two, three, four, five, six in order. So just keep that in mind. And we will use the fill handle a lot more later in the course. I just wanted to show you this quick tip because it could potentially save you a lot of time. I'm going to go ahead and delete these cells. Now that we got the dates formatted correctly, I think this is a good stopping point for this video. And we've put a good amount of work into this workbook. So if you haven't saved your workbook yet, I strongly suggest you do that. Remember, it's just file, save as, since we're saving it for the first time. Make sure you give your workbook a name. I'm going to call it monthly expenses and I'm saving it to my desktop and click save. Sorry, I already had one, but I'm going to go ahead and replace it. Click OK and we're done. OK, now that our monthly expense report is filled with labels, date values and numeric values, we are ready to start adding some formulas to build more info into this report. Currently, we have the individual expenses filled in for every month, which is great. So we could see that supplies was $125 for the month of January, and then it was $100 for February. Now, this is great, but with reports like this, it'd be nice to have a total at the end of each month so we could see what the total amount of expenses was for January, February, and so on. Or we can have totals at the end of the column so we can see the total of cost of goods sold throughout all three months. Now with Excel being such a powerful calculator, we can achieve these totals by building some basic formulas within our report. So let's go ahead and start building a formula to get the total amount of expenses for the month of January. So to start off, we need to click in cell B9 because this is where we want our total to be placed. Now the number one rule when writing formulas or using Excel functions you have to start them with the equal sign. And to start writing the formula, we can go ahead and start typing directly in the cell like we've been doing. So I can type an equal sign here, or I can come up to the formula bar and type the formula inside here. You could choose whichever one you prefer because either one would work just fine. Now to get the total, we need to start adding all the expenses together for the month of January. So for cost of goods sold, we had $1,000. Then we're going to click the plus sign to add these totals together. And for wages, we had 500 plus 750 for rent plus 125 and then plus 80 for utilities. Now, if I click enter, it should give us a total of $2,455. And if we go ahead and select and highlight all of our expenses and come down to the status bar, we could see that the sum has a total of 2,455 so we can cross check that to make sure our formula is correct and in which this case it is. Now the way I just showed you to achieve this total is not very efficient for two reasons. One, we had to manually enter the amount for each expense. In this case there's only five expenses so it's not too bad but let's say you had 50 expenses that's going to take quite some time. And two, if I go up here and change cost of goods sold to $2,000 instead of $1,000, our total remains the same. So now our total is off. So I would have to come back here, edit the formula, and change this to $2,000. And now we have the correct amount. I'm going to go ahead and undo that by clicking Control Z to get us back to the original amounts. And now for the month of February, I'm going to show you a different way so we can remove those potential cons that we just talked about. So for this formula, instead of manually entering the amount of each expense like we did for the month of January, we're going to be using a technique called cell referencing. Now, as always, to start off the formula, we have to start it with the equal sign. And to add these cells together using cell referencing, all we have to do is click the cells that we want to add. So we're going to start off with cost of goods sold, which is cell C4. Click the plus sign, wages, and repeat the process for each expense and now we can click enter which gives us a total of two thousand three hundred and twenty dollars and if we select our expenses go down to our status bar to cross check our answer 
looks like our formula is outputting the correct value, which is good. Now the advantages of using cell referencing is one that it eliminated quite a bit of time because we didn't have to enter the amount of each expense. And two, for example, let's say I go up to wages for the month of February. Instead of 500, we change it to 1500. That means our total should increase by $1,000. And if I click enter, you can see that our total went from 2,320 to 3,320. And if I click wages again and put it back to 500, it should go back to the original amount. Now this is still not the most efficient way to get a total sum of a column, but I wanted you to recognize the difference between mainly inputting the numbers and get some practice using cell referencing. Now this is a good point to get some practice in, so maybe you can go ahead and fill in the formula for the month of March, or you can take it a step further and get the total of the cost of goods sold across all three months, wages, rent, and so on. Alright, as you can tell that I went ahead and added the formula for the month of March and I did the formulas for each expense to give me the total of all three months. You can go ahead and check your answers and if something's not matching up, go ahead and leave a question or a comment because I'll be more than happy to help. And that goes for any time through the entirety of this course because if something's not making sense to you before I explain something wrong or if I even made a mistake, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So once again, please feel free to leave a comment or ask any questions anytime. Now that we got the basics on how to build a formula, we need to learn how Excel executes each part of the formula. And what I mean by that is order of operation. Now you may have heard of this term back in your elementary, middle school days, algebra days. I know a lot of people don't like math, but I hate to break it to you, Excel is all about math. Now, Excel does a really good job at doing the math for us, but we need to set up our formulas correctly so Excel will execute the formula in the way we want it to, to get us the correct values that we're looking for. Now, I'm going to give you a little acronym that I learned. It might be different than what you learned, but what it is is, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Now, this is the order that tells Excel which operation to calculate first. P is for parentheses, E is for exponents, then it goes multiplication and division, and then addition and subtraction. Now this is the order of operations that Excel will calculate first. What I mean by operator is that it's a symbol to perform a mathematical operation. So you got the multiplication sign, division sign, plus sign, minus sign, and so on. So just as a quick example, you don't have to follow me, I just want to show you a simple example of a formula that has a single operator and then multiple operators. In our formula, if I type in equals 5 plus 3, that has one single operator, the plus sign, and 5 plus 3 equals 8. Now if I go into our formula and adjust it and put 5 plus 3 times 2, now this formula has multiple operators. Now you would think it would go 5 plus 3 is 8 times 2, which will be 16. But according to our acronym, it does multiplication and division first, then addition and subtraction. So in this case, it's going to go 3 times 2 first, which is 6, then go to addition, which is plus 5, and 6 plus 5 is 11. Now let's go ahead and delete this and do an actual example with our monthly expense report. So let's say we want to get the average of expenses for each month. So what we want to do is type in the equal sign, click in cell B4, plus 500, plus 750, 125, plus 80, and then divide this by 5 because we have 5 expenses and we should get our average. So when I click enter, the average for the month of January was 2,391. Now if I select these cells, and highlight them and check down in our status bar. We can see here, whoa, our average is 491. So what went wrong? So let's click on our cell where our formula is and kind of dissect what is happening. Excel actually has a really neat built-in tool to show how Excel is calculating the formula. To check this, what we're gonna do is go to the formulas tab and then click evaluate formula. And here in this box, it shows that we are adding all the expenses together and then dividing by five. 
And if we click evaluate, we could see what this formula is actually doing. So it has a thousand for cost of goods sold plus 500, which is 1500 plus B six, which is 750, 1500 plus 750 is 2250. Then B seven is 125, 250 plus 22, sorry, 2250 plus 125 is 2375. Then lastly, B8, which is utilities, which is $80. And it should add 80 to the 2375. Uh-oh, it actually did 80 divided by five, which is 16. So it's taking 2375 plus 16, giving us 2391, which we know is incorrect. So we're gonna go ahead and click close. And then we're going to go back to our formula and we're going to adjust it to make sure that Excel calculates this formula in the correct order that we want it to. So we know based off our acronym that parentheses get executed first. So in our formula, we need to add some parentheses to get the correct answer. So we're going to go up to the formula bar, click inside here, add a open parentheses at the beginning of, and then add a close parentheses after we add all the expenses together. So now our formula says we're going to add all these expenses together, then divide by five. So if we click enter, now we see our average at 491, which based off in our status bar is the correct answer. And if we click our formula again and go back up to evaluate formula and click evaluate, now we could see that it's adding all the expenses together for a total of 2455, which is our total here, and then divided by five, which is 491. So you can see that if we don't tell Excel how to calculate the formula in the correct order, our answers are gonna be way off. So it's really important to understand this order of operation. So this is actually a great time to practice and maybe do the same process for the month of February and March. And I also encourage people to play around with it. Add parentheses, add some multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, and see how Excel handles the order of operation. All right, now that we got some experience building formulas using cell references, in this video, I will be discussing the different types of cell references and explain how they change when you copy a formula to a different cell. I'm going to clear out some cells here to give us a little bit more room to work and all I'm doing is selecting the cells I want to delete and pressing the delete key on my keyboard. All right, now that we got some space, I'm going to be talking about two different types of cell references. The first one is a relative reference. And what I mean by relative is that when you have cell references within your formula and you copy this formula to a different cell, the cell references will change based on the relative position of rows and columns. For example, in our January column, we have a formula at the bottom to give us the total of all the expenses, B4 plus B5, B6, and so on. So instead of doing the whole process of going into cell, typing the equal sign, and choosing the cells that we want to sum together, what we could do is actually grab the cell that we only had to type in the formula once and copy this formula to the cells that we want totals in. So what we're going to do is copy the formula that's in cell B9 by pressing Control C or Command C if you're on Mac. And then click the cell that we want to paste our formula into and click Control V or Command V if you're on Mac. Now if you pay really close attention, right now in cell B9 we have cells B4 plus B5 plus B6, B7, B8. And when we paste it to cell C9, so we're changing a column, we're moving one column to the right. I'm gonna press Control V. Now if you look in our formula, we have cells C4, C5, C6, C7, and C8. So once again, cell B9, all of our cell references have B, and cell C9, all of our cell references have C, while keeping the row numbers the same. Same thing goes for March. I'm going to click in the March column and click Control V to paste our formula. And right now we're still copying from cell B9 and we moved over two columns. So all of our cell references went from B4, B5 to B6 to D4, D5, D6 since we copied over the formula two columns. 
And since we didn't go down any rows, all of our row numbers stayed the same. So let's kind of do the same process for our totals in the very right column. So if we click in cell E4 that has our formula in it, and instead of copying, pasting the formula into the each cell individually, all we have to do is click in the cell and move your cursor to the bottom right hand corner of the cell until your cursor turns into a thin black cross. And from one of the previous videos, we know this is called the fill handle. And we can use this fill handle to copy formulas down rows or across columns. And before we copy this formula down, I want you to think about how these cell references are going to change. Right now we have B4 plus C4 plus D4. And now that we're copying down rows, what do you think is going to happen to the row numbers? So let's find out. We're going to click and drag all the way down. And then now if we click in the cells, we went from B4 to C4 to D4. And if we go down a cell, it goes B5, C5, D5. And once again, B6, C6, D6. So now that we are copying the formulas down the rows, the row numbers are changing. And since we stayed in the same column, our columns are staying consistent. Okay, so that was relative referencing. And you could tell that when we copied formulas across columns or down rows, the cell references within the formulas would change relative to their position. Now the next type of reference that we're going to be discussing is called an absolute reference. And we're going to have to expand our report a little bit to give a proper example of how absolute references work. So let's go ahead and add a new column to our report and we're going to call it percent of total. And our goal here is to get the percentage of each type of expense in regards to the total amount of expenses we paid for the past three months. So what we need to do is create a formula to get the percentage and then we can copy that formula down our percent of total column. So to start off, we got to type in the equal sign and then we're going to take cell E4, which is the total of cost of goods sold, divided by the total amount of expenses that we had to pay for all three months, which is cell E9. And we're going to click enter. So you can tell that the total expenses of cost of goods sold was 38% of the total amount of all expenses combined. Now if we click in this cell and we want to copy this formula down to the rest of the rows, we're going to grab our fill handle. And we're going to drag it down to the rest of our expenses. We're going to let go, see what happens. Oh, all right. So obviously we have some errors in our formula. So let's go back to our formula and kind of see what is happening. So if we click in the formula bar, we can see that we have E4 divided by E9, which is great. All right, then we're going to move down a cell, see what's happening here. Now we have E5, which is correct, divided by E10. So the cell reference actually moved down a row. So this cell is actually blank. And when you divide a number by zero, it's going to give you an error. So we want cell E9 to be constant. And that's what an absolute reference is, is that your cell references will remain constant regardless if you copy your formula down rows or across columns. So let's exit out of this and go back to our formula. And then we're going to go up to our formula bar. And to change cell E9 to an absolute reference, we have to put dollar signs before E and before 9. So when you see dollar sign E, dollar sign 9, that means that is not going to change. Or you can use a shortcut by clicking F4 on your keyboard and you can cycle through the different references. So if there's no dollar signs, that means it's relative. If there's both dollar signs, that means the column and the row number are going to stay constant. So we can click enter. Now our first one still looks correct. Now if we drag down this formula through the rest of our expenses, we should be getting the correct percentages. And from the start, so it's E4 divided by E9. Then if we go down one row, we should see E5 divided by E9. And if we go down one more, it's E6 divided by E9. So the first part of our equation is relative because we want to take each expense and then divide it by the total. And then after the division sign, the total amount, cell E9, stays constant. And that's a absolute reference.
Now that we've built some basic formulas within our report, it's time to introduce Excel functions. And what a function is, is a predefined formula that performs a calculation that's already built into Excel. So instead of building the formulas ourselves, Excel provides us a massive library of different types of functions that can increase our efficiency and save us a bunch of time. Now there's three parts to a function. Every function must begin with the equal sign, and then it will have the function name. And beside the function name will be parentheses, and this is where the arguments will be placed. And depending on which function we're using at the time will depend on how many arguments that function needs to use to give us the correct answer. Some functions may only need one argument, some other functions may need four arguments, so it just all depends. And as a quick example, I'm going to be inserting one of the most commonly used functions in Excel, which is the sum function. And we'll touch on this more in detail in the next video. So I'm going to start typing the equal sign and then sum. Double click sum right here. And the only reason why I'm showing this right now is to explain the function arguments window that we will be working in a lot throughout this course. To get to the function argument window, you want to go up here to the formula bar and just to the left, there's this FX button. This window is actually very helpful when using functions because it kind of gives you a guide on how to use the function. For example, it tells you what the function actually does. It explains each argument of the function. And there is a hyperlink to get help on the function, which will guide you to a Microsoft support page. So throughout this course, we will definitely be working in this window quite often. All right, so that's the basics of the function argument window. I'm going to cancel out of this. And now I'm going to show you where Excel stores all its functions. So we're going to go up here to the formula tab and right here under the function library group is where Excel has all their functions. And if you click on one of these books, it'll give you a drop down of all the functions within that book. And Excel does a pretty good job at organizing everything. So if you're looking for a math and trig function, you would click the math and trig book and scroll down to find what you're looking for. So that's pretty much the intro to Excel functions. And throughout this course, we're going to be using a lot of different functions to increase our workflow and make us more efficient. So in the previous video, I introduced to you what a function is, what it does, and how it's structured. Now it's time to actually incorporate some functions into our monthly expense report. The first function I'm going to be showing you is the sum function. Now the sum function is one of the most popular functions inside of Excel and it's used worldwide. So to start off, unfortunately, we're going to be deleting all the cells that we have formulas in there that sum up the values per month or per expense. So I'm selecting cells and clicking the delete key on my keyboard. And you can tell that our formulas over here in the percent of total column are giving us an error because there isn't any data in the total column. All right, so the first column that we're going to be using the sum function in is the January column. So we're going to click in cell B9. There's multiple ways to insert a function. I'll show you a few options. Then you can choose the way that you prefer. So the first way is going up to the formulas tab. And inside the function library, we're going to try to find the sum function. Now sum, that sounds like math and trig. So I'm going to click the math and trig book scroll down to the yeses and we can see the sum function right here. I'm just going to give that a click. Now the function arguments window automatically pops up and what the sum function does it tells us right here is that it adds all the numbers in a range of cells. Excel is pretty smart and it already gave us a suggestion of what range of cells to add but let's say it wasn't there. Okay so in our first argument Number one, we could click the cost of goods sold, which is B4. And then for number two, we can click wages, number three, rent. But this is kind of going back on what we did previously when we were building the formula. So this is still not the most efficient way. So we can delete all these. And instead of referencing a single cell, we can reference a range. So make sure we click inside number one. And then we're going to go to our report and select the cells that we want to sum. So I'm going to click in cell B4 and click and drag to B8. 
Now we can see that the numbers that this function is going to sum are 1,000, 500, 750, 125, and 80, giving us a total of 2,455. We're going to click OK. And if we select our cells again and check our status bar, it looks like that our sum function is working properly. Now you might have noticed this green triangle pop up here in the cell. This is Excel just trying to be helpful and it thinks that we might have left something out. It's not necessarily an error, but what is happening in this situation is that, remember that date values are actually numeric values in Excel. So our sum function is adding up these cells, and Excel is also looking at the cell above this selection, which is cell B3. Because since this is a numeric value, Excel is like, well, do you wanna add B3 to B8 instead of B4 to B8? For example, if I click this cell, and then click the warning symbol and click update this formula to include cells. See, we get this weird number because it's actually adding the date value. So I'm gonna click Control Z to undo that. And instead of updating the formula, I'm just gonna say ignore error. Now the green triangle is gone. Now from here, we could easily just click in this cell with our function in it and click and drag the fill handle to give us the totals for each column. But like I said, I wanted to show you multiple ways to insert a function, so I'm just going to go ahead and put that on hold for right now. So for the February column, I'm going to click in cell C9. And instead of searching in the function library, I'm going to type in the equal sign. And since I know what function I want to put in, I can just start typing the function name. This little drop box appears that has all the functions that have the word sum included in the name. So I'm going to give this a double click. Now the function argument window doesn't appear automatically doing it this way, but it does give you a little help bar down here showing you what arguments are needed. Now you might see that this argument doesn't have square brackets like this argument. That is because square brackets for arguments are optional, meaning that you don't have to have a number to argument. The arguments without the square brackets have to be inserted into the function in order for the function to work properly. And then from here, we can just select the cells that we want to sum and make sure we put a close parentheses and click enter. And it gives us a total of 2320. And once again, that green triangle appeared, but we can ignore it for now. And the last way to search for a function is if you click in the cell. So we're going to be summing the March column and go all the way up to the top in the search bar and we can search sum, give sum a double click and once again Excel is just trying to be helpful of what cells we want to sum. We can overwrite that by selecting cells just to make sure Excel doesn't include a wrong cell. So we're going to be summing D4 through D8, click OK and the sum for March is 2420. There is one neat function in Excel, which is called the AutoSum function. And if you could tell up here in our formulas tab, there's an AutoSum just for itself because the sum function in Excel gets used quite a bit. So if we click in cell E4 to give us a total of all costs of goods sold and click AutoSum, and you can see right down below there is a shortcut to AutoSum, which is Alt plus the equal sign. But for right now, I'm just gonna give this a click and you could tell that Excel knew which cells to automatically sum, which is cell B4 through D4. Click enter. And then once again, I'm going to click auto sum. Click enter. Now I'm going to do this one more time to show you that auto sum could potentially not sum the correct cells. So in cell E6, one more time, I'm going to click auto sum. And instead of going across the columns to sum, it is summing the two figures above it. Now this is because when you usually sum a column, you're putting a sum at the bottom of the column. And in this case, we're putting it to the right. That is why it's searching the cells vertically. So this is definitely something to be aware of. This is not the selection of cells we want, so we can just reselect the cells that we want to sum and click enter. And then for the rest, we can just click in the cell, use the fill handle, and drag down. Now we have the totals for each month and the totals for each expense without having to manually write the formula. Instead, we're using the sum function, which is a lot quicker, more efficient, and it saves us time.
And throughout this course, once we start incorporating more and more functions, you'll see how beneficial they actually are. All right, so now that we're a little bit familiar on how functions work, for the rest of this section, I'm going to be showing you a few other basic functions that get used quite frequently. And the first one that we will be discussing is the min function, aka the minimum function. So we're going to add this to our report, and we're going to click in cell A11 and type in min, so we know what this answer is. Right beside it, our goal is to achieve the minimum expense throughout January, February, and March. Now these functions are used to find just key data points within your data. All right, so we know a few ways how to add a function into our worksheet. So one of the ways is going up to the formulas tab and find the function in the function library. So we're looking for the min function to find the minimum value within our report. Now sometimes it might be hard to find what function you're looking for in these books. So minimum may be under math and trig. Let's scroll down to the M's. It's not there. I haven't mentioned this before, but if you go to more functions, there's statistical engineering, and I believe it's under statistical. And there it is. So we're going to give that a click. Now our function arguments window pops up. Now, once again, Excel is trying to be helpful to decide which cells we were going to look for. Right now it says B4 through B10. Well, that includes our total and this blank cell. So we don't want to do that. So let's go ahead and change this range of cells by clicking B4 and dragging down to B8. And down here, it tells you again what the function actually does, which is returns the smallest number in a set of values, ignores logical values and text. So we're going to click OK. And the minimum function gives us a value of 80. And if we go up in these cells and check each cell, we can tell that the minimum value is 80, which is utilities. And we also know how to quickly copy this formula across columns by using the fill handle. So we can click and drag that to the March column. And now we have the minimum value for each month. We have 80 for January, 100 for February, which is supplies, and 95 for March, which is utilities. Now, very similar, there is a maximum function, which returns the maximum value in a range of cells. So in cell A12, we're going to type in max. Come down here. And instead of searching it for in the functions library, I'm just going to start typing the equal sign and start typing max for maximum. Go ahead and give that a double click. And I know this little help box down here doesn't give you much information about the function. So let's go ahead and go to our functions arguments window by clicking the FX button. And you can tell that the maximum function returns the largest value in a set of values. So in our first argument, number one, we're going to click this and we're going to select the range of cells that we want to find the maximum in and click OK. And we can see that the maximum value for January is cost of goods sold, which is $1,000. And we can click and drag the fill handle to copy this function across the columns. And now we have the maximum for all three months. And it looks like it's all in cost of goods sold. All right, so that's the min and max function. Pretty simple to use, easy to understand, and is very useful when you're trying to find key data points such as the minimum value and the maximum value within a range of cells. All right, so let's just keep on going and start adding some more useful functions within our report. All right, so once again, I'm going to be showing you another commonly used Excel function that is very useful in reports, and it's called the average function. And just like how it sounds, it calculates the average of a group of values. So we're going to add it here at the very bottom of our report in cell A13. I'm going to type in average or AVG for short. Click tab to go to the next cell. And we're going to start by typing in the equal sign and then average. Go ahead and give average a double click. Click the FX button to open our function arguments window. And we could see the definition of the average function returns the average of its argument, which can be numbers or names, arrays, references that contain numbers. So for our number one argument, we are going to select the cells that we want to average and click OK. So the average of our expenses for the month of January is 491. And we can select these cells, go down to our status bar, 
and the average is 491. So our function is calculating correctly. And from here, we know how to copy this function across columns. So we're just going to click and drag the fill handle to get the average for each month. So the average for January was 491. The average for February was 464. And lastly, the average cost of the expense for March was 484. More than likely, you will run into a situation where you will have to find the average of a range of numbers. And using the average function is a lot easier and a lot more efficient than building a formula that sums up all the expenses and then dividing by the count of expenses like we did in one of the previous videos when we were talking about order of operations. So once again, very simple function to use, but it's also very useful. Okay, so there is two more simple functions that I want to show you. The count function and the count a function. And once we start building our example, it would be easier to pinpoint the differences between the two. So to start off, I will be demonstrating the count function. So down in cell A14 at the bottom of the report, I'm going to type in count. I'm going to click tab to get to the next cell over. And I'm going to start typing the equal sign count. I'm going to give the count function a double click. Go up to our FX button to open up the function arguments window. And what this function does is that it counts the number of cells in a range that contains numbers. So for our first argument, we are going to select the cells that we want to count. So let's go ahead and count the number of expenses that we have in January. So we're going to select all of our expenses and click OK. So it shows that we have five expenses and we can tell that we have one, two, three, four, five. So that is correct. And down below the count function, we are going to add a count a function. So to the right of this cell, I'm going to start typing the equal sign and then count. And instead of clicking the count function, we're going to click the count a function. Open up the function arguments window. And as we can tell that count a counts the number of cells in a range that are not empty. So count was numbers. This one is count the cells that are not empty. So I'm going to select the cells, the same cells that we use for the count function and see if we see a difference here. I'm going to click OK. And once again, the value is five. So to show the difference between the two, I'm going to come up here into our report and delete one of these numbers. Let's say rent. I'm going to delete rent. And now we can tell that our count and count a function both went to four because count counts the numbers and there's only four numbers one two three four and count a counts the number of cells that are not empty well rent is empty so it's still one two three four but let's say in rent i put a text value i'm just going to type in text now our count a shows five and our count still shows four. That's because count, once again, is counting the numbers. So within this range, there are four numbers and the count A just counts all the cells that are not empty. Now, even though the text is not a number, this cell is not empty. That's why count A is counting five. And just for the fun of it, I will show you one more function, which is the count blank function. And you might already have a pretty good idea what this function does. And if we look at the function arguments window, it counts the number of empty cells in a specific range of cells. So we're going to go ahead and click the same range that we've previously done for the past two functions. Click OK or enter. And right now the count blank is showing zero because there's no empty cells. Now if I get rid of this text value, and click enter, the count blank function shows there is one empty cell. And now if I put rent back to 750, the count function should count five because there's five numeric values. The count A should show five because all the cells are full. And the count blank should go to zero because there's no empty cells. Let's see. And like I said, those are the correct answers. So I just wanted to show you these quick 
useful functions because you may run into a situation where you actually need to count the amount of records you have in your data or count how many blank cells there are or count how many numeric values are in a range of data. And you can tell that these functions are actually quite used often because they are listed here in the status bar. See, we have the average, count, the min, max, sum. If you don't see the min and max, remember you just give this a right click and you can uncheck or check what you want. So that's a simplified intro to Excel functions. And as you can tell, they save us a lot of time because we don't have to manually write the formula to perform calculations. Excel has these built-in functions that all we need to do is provide arguments for the function to calculate the answer for us. Okay, so for this video, I will be explaining how we can move, copy, and paste our data into different areas of our spreadsheet or even to a different spreadsheet. So the first example I'm gonna show you is how we can actually just move our data set to a different location on the spreadsheet. For example, what if we wanted to move our data down a couple rows and over a couple columns just for formatting purposes because we don't like it all tucked away here in the top left corner. So what we wanna do is select all the data. So from A1 all the way to F16, that selects all of our data. And one of the options is to move the cursor to the edge of the border until your cursor turns into a cross with four little black arrows. And once we see our cursor change, we can click and drag our data anywhere we want. So if we wanna move our data down two rows and over one column and let go, now all of our data is moved. And the neat thing about this is that it does not mess up any formulas. All of our cell references get moved as well. So if we take a look at one of our sum functions down here, now it's summing cells C6 through C10. That goes for relative and absolute references. Because we use an absolute reference here in our percent of total to always reflect the total amount of expenses. So if we click in one of these formulas, we could tell that F6 is a relative reference and cell F11 is absolute. So absolute references and relative references get moved when we're moving our data. Another option is using the cut command. And now let me show you what that does. So once again, if we select our data and we can come up here to the home tab and under the clipboard group, we can click cut. And then we have these moving ants that surround our border. And we can click anywhere we want, come back to the home tab, go under the clipboard group, and click paste. Now it cut this data and moved it over here. A quick shortcut that we can use that you're probably already familiar with because you might have already used it in other applications is selecting the data and on your keyboard click Control X or Command X if you're on Mac and then click in a cell where you want your data to start then press the shortcut of Control V as in Victor or Command V if you're on Mac. So once again, it cuts the data and moves the data to the cell that you selected. This technique also works if you're just trying to move a single cell. For example, if I click down in rent of January 2020 and move my mouse over to the edge of the border, I can just move this individual cell. And then I'm gonna press Control Z to move that back. Now I'm gonna explain the difference between copying data versus cutting data. So once again, we are gonna select the entire range of our data. And instead of clicking the cut command, we're gonna click the copy command. And once again, we see the moving ants around our border. And let's say we wanna copy it just a few columns over. So I'm gonna click in cell K3, and then I'm gonna click paste. So before, when we were cutting the data, it actually removed all this data and moved it over here. Copying keeps the original and then creates a copy so the original doesn't get deleted. And both of these methods update our formulas as well. So now our sum function is showing L6 through L10, which is correct. 
Now, if you want to get rid of the marching ants around the border, all you have to do is click the escape key on your keyboard and that will get rid of those marching ants. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this data by selecting the whole range and clicking delete on my keyboard. So I showed how we can copy and cut within one Excel spreadsheet. But what if you want to copy data to a different Excel spreadsheet? So very quickly, we're going to come down here and add a new sheet by clicking this plus sign. Now depending on which version of Excel you're in, you might have a different icon. It might be up here in the sheet tab. But since I'm running on Microsoft Office 365, I have a plus symbol right here. So I'm going to click this plus sign and now I have a new sheet. So if I go back to sheet one, select our range of data and a shortcut to use is control C for copy. And then we can go to sheet two and press the shortcut control V to paste. So now all of our formulas are still intact and we have data on our sheet one and data on sheet two. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this data again by selecting the cells and clicking delete. Now I want to share just one more quick tip with you when we are copying and pasting data from one sheet to another. So let's go back to sheet one. So just for example, let's say our spreadsheet was filled with data all over the place. So let me just copy and paste data in a few areas. Now there's data all over the place, but we want to copy all this data to sheet two. It would take some time to select each region and paste it to the other worksheet. So to copy the whole worksheet, what we can do is go to the top left hand corner of our cells and there's this little arrow right here between column A and row 1. If we give that a click, it will highlight the whole sheet and we can use our shortcut control C as in cat. Then go down to sheet 2 and click the arrow once again and press the shortcut control V to paste. Now we have copied all of our data from sheet 1 to sheet 2. You can also clear all the content of the cells by clicking the arrow and pressing delete on your keyboard. But there is a shortcut to selecting all the cells on your worksheet. So instead of clicking this arrow, we can click the shortcut control A or command A if you're on Mac and then press delete on our keyboard to delete all the cells within our worksheet. Okay, so for this video, we are going to be talking about how we can insert and delete rows and columns. There's a few different ways to do this. And by now we should be able to see that some ways in Excel are a little bit more efficient than other ways. But I want to show you all the options so you get a little bit more familiar with the Excel interface. And you might prefer one way over the other. All right, well to start off, let's say we want to insert some rows between these two groups of data. So right here in row 10. The first option is to click where you want to insert the row come up to the home tab, go to the cells group, and we can't just click this insert command because this is inserting cells, not a row. But let me go ahead and show you what insert cells does. So if I click this insert command, we could tell that it inserted cell right below row 10. So it didn't insert a whole row. It just inserted one cell and shift the rest of these cells down. So I'm going to press control Z as in zero to undo. And once again, we're going to make sure we have a cell in row 10 selected, come back up to the home tab to the cells group. And we're going to click this drop down for the insert command. Now we can see that there is a insert sheet rows command. And if we click that, it will enter a whole row. And if we want to delete a row, we can just come up to the cells group again and click our drop down and select delete sheet rows. And in this case, we will be deleting row 10 because we have a cell selected in row 10. So if we click delete sheet rows, it deletes that row and shifts all the rows underneath it back up. Now another option we can do is come over here and move your cursor to the rows. And you'll see that your cursor will turn into a black arrow pointing to the right. This is how we select a whole row. So if we give row 10 a click, we can see that it selected the whole row. And then we can go to the home tab, back to the cells group, and instead of selecting the drop down, 
we can just click insert because we have the whole row selected. Now we've entered a new row and if we click it again another row is entered. Same thing for deleting. We don't have to click the drop down to delete the row. Now that we have the whole row selected we can just click delete and we can delete one more time. Another quick way to insert and delete rows and columns is using keyboard shortcuts. So right now we have row 10 selected. If we press Control plus on our keyboard or command plus if you're on Mac, we can insert rows this way. And if you don't have a full keyboard, meaning that you don't have a number pad on the right side of your keyboard, your plus sign may be at the top where the plus and equal sign share the same key. So in that case, you would have to press Control shift plus or command shift plus if you're on Mac. And to delete a row using a keyboard shortcut is to make sure you have the row selected that you want to delete and press Control minus or Command minus if you're on Mac. And that will delete a row. And if you want to get really quick with using Excel shortcuts, there's one more way. For example, let's say we're working in this cell over here, M10, and we want to add a row. Well, we know that we can just come over here to the row number and select it and then use the keyboard shortcut Control plus to insert a row. To take the time away moving your cursor all the way to the row number, what we could do is select a cell in a row that we want to add or delete and use the keyboard shortcut shift spacebar to select the row and then control plus sign to add a row. Same thing goes for columns. Let's say we want to insert a column between row E and F. So once again, we need to move our cursor to the column heading where we want to insert a column and then we can come up here and click insert or once again use your keyboard shortcuts it's the same ones as a row so I'm going to press control plus and it'll insert a column or control minus to delete a column and if you notice throughout that whole process all of our formulas are getting updated as well so all of our cell references are moving as we insert rows delete rows or insert columns and deleting columns. So get some practice in, learn those shortcut keys because it will save you some time. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this column. So I'm gonna select a column, control minus. And if you wanna delete multiple rows or columns, you can select multiple rows and you can go up to the home tab in the sales group and press delete or use your shortcut keys, control minus to delete multiple rows at once. Okay, so for this video, we're going to be talking about how we can adjust the width and height of cells. And once again, there are various ways to do this. So I'll show you a few different options and then you can choose based on your preference. All right, so to get started, let's say we want to change the height of cell A1. The first option we can do is come up to the Home tab and go over to the Sales group and click the drop down for Format. And underneath cell size, we see an option for row height. So if we give that a click, right now our current row height is 15. And if we want to make the row larger, we can change this to 25. Now our row one is definitely larger than the rest of our rows. Same thing goes for column width. If we go back to the home tab and click the drop down for format, we can choose adjust column width. And currently the column width is 8.43 and we can change that to a larger number. Now column A is definitely much wider. Another option is to move our cursor to the bottom of the row that we wanna adjust. So we wanna adjust row one. And as you can see, our cursor changed to a vertical double headed arrow. Now we can click and drag to the row height of our liking. So if we click and drag down, it will expand the row, or if we click and drag up, it will condense the row. Same thing goes for columns. If I want to expand column A, I would move my cursor all the way to the right. Now we have a horizontal double arrow with a black line intersecting it, and we can click and drag to the right to expand the column, or we can click and drag to the left to make our column narrower. And if we look at cell A1, our text extends past our column width. Same thing goes for cell A16. Count blank gets cut off 
because there is a value in the cell next to it. So we would definitely want to make this column wider so we can read our full text values. Now a quick tip, if we move our cursor between columns A and B again, and once our cursor changes, we can give this a double click, it would automatically adjust the width of the column to fit all the text within that column. So to show you, I'm going to give this a double click. Now the column width fits monthly expenses and count blank. We can use this technique across multiple columns or multiple rows. For example, if I select column A through F, I can move my cursor between any of the columns within the selection and drag left or right to expand or condense the columns. Or I can go back in between any of the columns and give it a double click to automatically adjust every single column to the correct width. Now column E looks a little too condensed, so what I'm going to do is select the columns again and maybe adjust the width to right here. Same thing goes for the rows. If we select all of our rows, move our cursor between any of the rows, and we can click and drag to adjust the row height as well. And one more option is to select a row, give the row a right click, and go down to the row height, and we can adjust the row height from here. And before we move on to the next lecture, there is one more thing that I need to point out. For example, let's say I'm adjusting column B and I want to make it narrower. If I go too narrow, look what happens to my date value. It's just a bunch of pound signs now. Now this could potentially throw people off and make them assume that there is an error, but in reality it's just because the column width is too small. So if I go up between column B and C again, give it a double click, now our date value is back to how it was. Now in column A, all we have is text values. And if I adjust the width of column A, to be smaller. Notice that our text values don't go to the pound symbols. This is because the pound symbols only appear if you have numeric data within the cells. So this is definitely something to keep your eye out for. So in the previous video we learned how to insert and delete rows and columns. But for this lecture I'm going to be explaining how we can hide and unhide rows and columns. Now the purpose of hiding rows and columns is to hide data that you don't want to be visible to the user. Or you might have some extra data over here that these formulas reference, but this data actually doesn't need to be visible to the user, it's just used for formulas. So for this scenario it would be useful to hide this data so that users don't get confused or accidentally mess up the cells that the formulas reference. Now once again, there are a few ways to hide and unhide rows and columns. For example, let's say we want to hide column E. First we need to select the column, then give it a right click, and we can choose hide. And this will hide the column. Now if you notice, between column D and F, there is a little double line right here. This symbolizes that there is a column hidden between column D and F. Now if you want to unhide this column, what we need to do is select columns D through F, give it another right click, and click unhide. Now column E is back to being displayed. Now if you want to hide multiple rows and columns, we can do that as well. For example, let's say we want to hide rows 11 through 16. So first we need to select all the rows, give it a right click, and click hide. Once again, we see that double line between row 10 and 17, signifying that there are rows hidden between row 10 and 17. Now to unhide, all we have to do is select the rows 10 through 17, right click, and click unhide. Now all of our rows are back to being unhidden. We can also use Excel shortcut keys to speed up this process a little bit. For example, let's say we want to hide row 11. All we have to do is click any cell that is in row 11 and on your keyboard all you have to do is press Control 9 or Command 9 if you're on Mac and that will hide the entire row. And now if we want to unhide row 11 we have to select cells in row 10 and 12 and the shortcut key is Control Shift 9 and that will unhide a row. 
Now let's do another example, and this time we're going to hide non-contiguous columns. So let's say we want to hide columns B, D, and F. So we're going to go up and select column B, press the control key and then select column D, keep holding the control key and then select column F. Now we have multiple columns selected and the shortcut key to hide columns is control zero. Now we have multiple columns hidden. And let's also hide a couple rows. Let's select row 11, press the control key, select 13 and 15. And we can use the shortcut key control nine to hide the rows. So now we have multiple columns and multiple rows hidden. And let's say that we want to unhide every row and every column. It would take quite some time to select each one and click unhide or use the shortcut key. So what we could do is move your cursor to the top left corner of the cells between row one and column A to select all the cells. And then we can move our cursor to one of the column headings, give it a right click and click on hide. That will unhide all the columns. Same thing for the rows. All we have to do is right click one of the rows and click on hide. Now all of our columns and rows are unhidden. And another useful tip, if you don't want to see these column headings or row numbers, you can come up to the view tab and deselect headings. Now the headings are gone. This is more for presentation purposes, but having headings on while you're working is a lot useful so we can see which cells we're working with. All right, so for this video, we will be discussing how to rename, move, and delete Excel worksheets. So to start off, let's go ahead and rename our current worksheet. What we need to do is come down here to the sheet tab and there's two ways to rename this. We can either double click on the sheet tab and we can start typing a new name for the worksheet. So let's call this sheet report and we can click enter and now this sheet is named report. The other way is by coming down to the sheet tab again right clicking on the sheet tab and clicking rename and once again it highlights it but since we already had the name in there I'm just going to press enter again and I strongly advise getting into the habit of renaming your sheets because sometimes in Excel workbook you might have 15 sheets or even more and instead of clicking through sheet 1, sheet 2, sheet 3, sheet 4 to figure out which sheet you need to do work in we can easily locate our report by the sheet name. All right, next let's talk about deleting worksheets. And for this example, I'm going to add a few more sheets. And what we need to do is click this plus sign down here at the bottom next to our sheet tabs. I'm going to give it just a few clicks to add some sheets. And let's say we want to delete sheet two. What we're going to do is right click on the sheet tab that we want to delete and click delete. So pretty simple, but there is a catch when you are deleting worksheets. This action cannot be undone. And you will notice if you come up here to the quick access toolbar, the undo button is grayed out. We cannot undo deleting worksheets. So if you accidentally delete a worksheet, I would make sure to not save your workbook, close it, and when you open back up, your sheet that you accidentally deleted will still be there. Now let's talk about moving worksheets. I'm going to come back down here to the sheet tabs, add a new sheet. And let's say we want to move our report sheet between sheet one and sheet three. All we have to do is click and drag the worksheet. And you, you notice there's a little black arrow showing where we want to place the sheet. So if we want to place it between sheet one and sheet three, the black arrow will be right in between those and we'll let go. Now it goes sheet one, report, then sheet three. Let's go ahead and move our report sheet back to the beginning. Now let's talk about how we can create a copy of a worksheet. So the first option we can do is to give our sheet tab a right click and click move or copy. So we want to select a sheet that we want to create a copy of, which is the report sheet. Come down and make sure we click this checkbox, create a copy. And if we click OK, now our report 
two sheep has been created. The reason why the two pops up is because you cannot have two sheets with the same name. Another way to create a copy of a worksheet is to click Control on your keyboard or Command if you're on Mac and click and drag to where you want to create the copy and you should see a little paper symbol with a plus icon show up and if we let go now our report 3 sheet has been created. We can also move sheets to different workbooks that we have open as well. For example, I'm going to open up another workbook. So now I have a new workbook, Book 1, open. And I'm going to come back to our monthly expense report. I'm just going to take one of the copy report sheets. And I'm going to give this sheet tab a right click. Go back to Move or Copy. So up here it says Move Selected Sheets. So the sheet that I want to move is report number three. And right here where it says to book, right now we're in the monthly expense workbook. But if we click this drop down arrow, we can select book one, and then we can select where we want the sheet to be placed. So either before sheet one or move to the end. I'm just gonna select move to the end and click okay. So now we're back in book one and we have our blank sheet one and we moved our copy report to the end inside of book one. But this is what you need to watch out for. If we go back to our monthly expense workbook, now we don't see the report three sheet. It's because we moved it to a new workbook and didn't create a copy to the new workbook. So for example, let's say we wanna create a copy of the report two sheet to the new workbook that we created. We would give this sheet a right click Select Move or Copy. We're going to choose which book we want to move it to. So Book 1. And then we're going to select Create a Copy and move it to the end and click OK. So now we're back in Book 1. And now we have Sheet 1, Report 3, and Report 2. And now if we go back to our monthly expense workbook, our Report 2 sheet is still there. All right, so for this lecture, we're going to be talking about how we can add cell protection to our worksheet. Now, if you ever shared your workbook with another user, you have probably found that there are specific cells that you don't want them to modify, especially the cells that contain formulas or special formatting. So adding protection does two things. One, it gives user a little bit more comfortable feeling working inside your spreadsheet so they don't have to worry about accidentally messing something up. And two, it protects the functionality of our spreadsheets. So we know that our formulas won't get deleted and still reference the correct cells. So let's take our report, for example, and add protection to our report. So let's say we use this report every three months. The expenses stay the same, the title stays the same, everything stays the same, except for maybe the months and the cost of each expense but all the formulas and functions to get the total, percent of total, min, max, average, and so on remain the same. So we only want to allow the users to change cells B3 to D8, just the months and the cost of each expense. Now automatically, every cell has their lock property turned on. For example, in cell A1, if we select the cell, give it a right click, go down to Format Cells, And if we come over to this protection tab, we could see that the lock property is turned on. Even though that the lock property is turned on, it doesn't do us any good without actually protecting the worksheet. So let's go ahead and do that now. We're going to click OK to get out of this. Come up to the Review tab and select Protect Sheet. And down here, we see there's an option to enter a password. This is optional, you don't have to, but if you do enter a password, it's very important that you do not forget the password because it can be really challenging to unlock a spreadsheet without the correct password. So make sure you write it down somewhere and don't forget it, keep it in a safe location. So we're gonna click OK. So now the worksheet is locked. And if I try to come up here back in cell A1, and start typing. We get a warning message saying the cell or chart you're trying to change is on a protected sheet. 
And that goes for any cell. So if we try to change the cost of goods sold of January from 1,000 to 2,000, we'll get that warning message again. We'll go ahead and click OK. So if we want users to be able to change the months and the cost of each expense, is to select the cells that we can allow them to change. Give the selection a right click. Uh, format cells is grayed out because the sheet is still protected. So this shows that when a sheet is protected, users can't change the properties of these cells. So I'm going to go back up here and click Unprotect Sheet. Now we can give our selection a right click. Go to Format Cells. Click the Protection tab and uncheck the Lock property and click OK. Now if we go back up to our Review tab and select Protect Sheet, click OK. Now every cell in our spreadsheet is locked except for the months and the cost of the expenses. So once again, if I try to change cell A1, we get our warning message. But if I come down here and cost of goods sold for January, I can change it from 1,000 to 2,000. And our formulas will update. So adding protection gives us a little sense of insurance, not just for us, but also for the user. Because we are worried about the user messing up the functionality of our spreadsheet. But also, the user can go in here freely and not worry about messing anything up. For example, if they accidentally click delete on one of the sum functions to give us the total, they won't be able to, so our formulas will stay intact, making sure that our spreadsheet still produces the correct values. Alright, so in the last video, we talked about how we can protect certain cells within a worksheet. Now we're going to discuss how we can protect the structure of a workbook. Protecting the structure of a workbook is not necessarily protecting the cells, but we are protecting the actual sheet tabs themselves, meaning that we are preventing users from adding new sheets, deleting sheets, and move, copy, or renaming sheets. So for example, I'm going to press and hold the control key on my keyboard, or the command key if you're on Mac, and select the sheet tab and drag over to create a few copies. Now we have three individual sheets. And now to protect the structure of the workbook, we're going to come up here to the Review tab and select Protect Workbook. And down here we have a password that is optional to use. And I'm going to give you the same advice again when adding a password to a sheet or a workbook. Make sure that you remember the password or store it in a safe location to find later because if you forget the password, it's very hard to unlock a workbook or worksheet without the password. But for now, we're going to leave the password empty and make sure that the structure box is checked and click OK. And if we go down to our sheet tabs and try to rename a sheet, if we right click, now all of our insert, delete, rename, move, or copy is grayed out. Now we don't have to worry about users accidentally adding sheets, deleting sheets, or renaming, moving, and copying sheets. So once again, pretty simple process to do. This just adds a little extra security to the structure of our workbook. And if you want to unprotect the workbook, all you have to do is go back to the Review tab, click Protect Workbook, and if you entered a password, it would prompt you for a password. But since we didn't, now this Protect Workbook is not grayed out anymore. Now we can add sheets, delete sheets, or rename, move, and copy worksheets. All right, I know that we've talked a lot about adding protection to the cells of the worksheet and the structure of the workbook, but there is one more protection option that we can add to really secure our workbook, which is prompting users to enter a password to open up an Excel file. There might come a time where you need to send out a workbook, but you only want to allow people with the password to be able to open it or even for yourself. Let's say you have a workbook that has a list of all your emails and passwords and other sensitive information. It would be ideal to add a password to the Excel workbook just in case if it ever gets in the wrong hands, nobody will be able to view your information. So to prompt users for a password to open the file, what we need to do is come up to the File tab, click Info, and select Protect Workbook. Now we have a bunch of different options but we need to click Encrypt with Password. Now once again, it's very important to not forget this password. 
but we're gonna go ahead and enter any password that you want. Click OK. And then it's gonna ask you to re-enter the password just for clarification. Click OK. And now we have to make sure we click Save. Now the next time we open this file, we will be prompt to enter a password. So let me go ahead and show you that. I'm gonna exit out of this Excel file. And I personally have the file saved on my desktop, but what you wanna do is find the file, open it, and now we have a little dialog box to enter a password. So I'm gonna enter the password, click OK, and now we have granted access to the workbook. To remove the password, what we can do is go up to File, go back to Info, Protect Workbook, click Encrypt with Password, and remove the password, and click OK, and make sure you click Save. Now the next time we open this file, we'll get instant access to the workbook. Okay, so for this section, we're gonna be focusing on four main formatting groups. And these groups can be located in the Home tab, and we have Font, Alignment, Number, and Styles. All these groups are related to cell formatting. Cell formatting is the key to making a visually pleasing Excel spreadsheet. And not only does it make it look nice, but it helps draw users' attention to what's important, what the data actually means, and it's easier to read. Because right now, if we look at our report, everything's just black and white, and at first glance, it's hard to read the data because everything is so condensed together. And we can create some separation with this data by applying cell formatting. So for the remainder of this section, we're gonna focus on making this report look all clean, organized, and easy to read. And I suggest following along so you can get the hang of it. You don't have to do exactly what I do. If you wanna use a different color or a different font, go right ahead. But this is a great time to start practicing some Excel formatting. So let's get right to it. The first thing we're gonna do is focus on the title in cell A1. So we're gonna click inside the cell, and I think a nice big bold title would look nice so when users come and open this report, they can look right at the title and know exactly what this report means. So to make this text bold, we're gonna come up to the Home tab, and underneath the font group, we're gonna click this B for bold. Now our text is bold. Still kinda of small, so let's increase the font size a little bit. Currently, we're at 11. We can click this A to go up, or we can choose from the drop-down list and choose what font we want. I think 18 looks nice. Now the font's a little bit too big for the row height, so I'm gonna move my cursor between row one and two, give it a double click, so it can automatically adjust to the correct row height. Now let's take a look at our headings. Currently, they're kind of blended in with the rest of our data, and a good option to apply to column headings is a fill color. So to change the background color of these cells, we're gonna go back to the font group and click on this paint bucket. And by default, the paint bucket is yellow, but if we click this drop down arrow, we can select the color we want. I think a nice blue color would look good, so I'm gonna click the blue accent one. But now the black text kinda blends in with the blue. So let's change the text. So right next to the paint bucket, there's this A with the color underneath it. By default, it's red. So to change, we're gonna click the drop down arrow once again, and I think white text will look good with blue. And to really make these column headings stand out a little bit more, let's make them bold. And we already know that we can press B up here in the font group, or we can use a shortcut key on our keyboard, which is Control B as in boy, or Command if you're on Mac. Now our column headings really pop. Now we can easily tell which column means what. Same thing goes for the row labels. Let's apply some formatting to separate them from the rest of the data. So let's select our labels. And this time for the fill color, let's choose a light gray. I think that looks good. And lastly, our totals are one of the most important values within this report. So we definitely need to apply some cell formatting for these totals to stick out because right now they're a little bit blended in with the rest of the data. And we want users to easily be able to read the totals for each expense. So let's select our totals. And to make multiple selections, you need to press Control on your keyboard or Command if you're on Mac, hold it down, and make your other selection. So now we have the total column and the total row selected. We're going to come back up to our font group, 
and let's select this little light yellow and make these totals bold. Now we're getting somewhere because we're starting to see the separation between the data. We can easily read our column headings, our row labels, our totals, and the users know where to enter the cost of each expense. And one last thing, our column headings look a little bit crammed right now. So I'm going to move my cursor between rows three and four and increase the row height a little bit. I think that looks good. And then I'm also going to select the columns to increase the column width a little bit. All right, I think that looks good. And with applying just a little bit of cell formatting, our report is looking a lot more organized and easier to read. And this is just the beginning. In the next few videos, we will discuss even more formatting options to make this report more pleasing to the eye. All right, now that we got some cell background color for our column headings, our row labels, and our totals, and added some bolded fonts to signify some important values within our data, now we're gonna start adding some borders to our cells to create even more separation between our data. To start off, I'm gonna go ahead and add another column to the left of our report, just so that our report is not hugging the left side of our worksheet, and it'll be easier to see the cell borders. So to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and click column A, and on my keyboard, I'm gonna press Control plus, or Command plus if you're on Mac, to add a new column. So when it comes time to apply some cell formatting, it's all based on your preference. So for this video, I'm gonna do what I think looks good, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it the exact same way I do it. If you don't like one of the borders I put on, don't do it. Play around with it and apply some borders that you think looks nice. So to start off, I'm gonna apply a thick border around our whole report. So to do that, I'm gonna select cells B3 to G9. I'm gonna come up here to the Home tab, and within the font group, this window pane looking symbol is where we can apply borders. So by default, right now is selected for a bottom border. To change that, I'm gonna select the drop down arrow and I'm gonna select thick outside border. I'm gonna select a different cell so we can see our border. Now our report has a nice thick outline. Now I'm gonna go in and start to apply other borders to create more separation between our data. So I think having a border between our column headings and our data would look good. So I'm gonna select the column headings, go back to the font group, and this time I'm gonna select the drop down, and I think a thin bottom border would look nice. Select another cell so we can see what we applied. Okay, so now our report's looking a little bit better. Another area where we can apply some separation between our values is the row labels. So I'm gonna select our row labels, come up to the font group, select the drop down, and this time I'm gonna apply a right border. And lastly, I think a border between the cost of each expense and the totals would look good. So I'm gonna select the totals down here at the bottom and then apply maybe a top border. Let's see what we got. And that's starting to look good. And then let's do the same thing for the totals on the right. So we're gonna select our totals. And this time, instead of coming up to the font group and selecting the drop down arrow, Another option we can do is give the selection a right click, go to Format Cells, go to the Border tab, and currently, if we look at this border section down here, our selection has a thick top border and a thick bottom border. But what we want to do here is add a thin left border and a thin right border to our selection. So to do that, we need to select the border style that we want which is this thin line here at the bottom left. And then we can select the left border and we can see that the thin line on the left showed up. And then same thing for the right. We can click the right border. And now the right border showed up. And if we click OK, select a different cell so we can see what we applied. Now we have some good separation between our data and it looks very organized and easy to read. To get a better preview of this, we can come up to the File tab and click Print. 
And if you notice, the grid lines of the cells don't automatically print. There is an option to print the grid lines, which we will discuss later in the course. But looking at this print preview, you have a better visual idea what this report's going to look like if you print it out on a piece of paper or save it to a PDF file. And as of right now, I think it looks really good. And personally, when it comes to cell formatting, I think less is more. Because if you apply too much formatting, it can get a little bit hard on the eyes. But as of right now, I think it's pretty simple to read. We can easily see what our column headings are, our row labels, and our totals. And then in the next video, we'll discuss actually applying some formatting to the numeric values within this report. All right, so for this video, we're going to be talking about how we can format our numeric data. Because currently, our values look pretty bland right now. And in this report, our numbers are actually monetary values. And usually when you deal with money, the correct format is usually having a dollar sign, commas, and two decimal places. So to convert these numbers to monetary values, we have two options. For example, I'm going to take the cost of goods sold for January. And I'm going to come up to the Home tab, go to the Numbers group, click the drop down, and the two options to convert numbers to monetary values are currency and accounting. So for cost of goods sold for January, I'm going to select the currency format. And now our regular 1000 figure has a dollar sign, comma, and two decimal places. And now for cost of goods sold for February, I'm going to choose the accounting format. Now there's two main differences between currency and accounting. For the currency format, you can tell that the dollar sign is right next to the value. And for the accounting format, the dollar sign is aligned all the way to the left. And this is just a preference of how you want your spreadsheet to look. For example, if I select the whole January column and select the format of currency, the dollar sign is always just to the left of the value. And if I select the February column and change the format to all accounting, you can see that the dollar signs are all left aligned. And then another difference between currency format and accounting format is how they handle negative values. For example, if I change the cost of goods sold for January to a negative 1000, and this is for the currency format, I'm going to click enter. Now we just have a negative sign out in front of the value. But if I go over to cost of goods sold for February on the accounting format and change it to negative 850, you can see that there is no negative sign, but in accounting, a negative number is presented with two parentheses around the value. So once again, choosing the format that you want to use is just based all on preference. So you can decide how you want your values to look. But for this case, I'm going to change all of our monetary values to the accounting format. And I'm going to change the cost of goods sold back to 1000 and 850. This is great and all because now we can tell that we are dealing with money, but our report looks a little bit congested with all the dollar signs. So what I like to do is remove the dollar signs except for maybe the top row and the bottom row to signify that we're dealing with money and also have a clean report. So I'm going to select all the cells except for the top row and the bottom row, come up to the number group and click this comma button. This comma style format removes the dollar signs. So if we give that a click, now our dollar signs are removed, but we could still see that we're dealing with money based off the first row and the last row. And just to make it a little bit easier to read, I'm going to select these rows and increase the row height just a tad. So it gives us a little bit more white space between our values and it's a little bit easier on the eyes. Now I want to take a look at the percent of total column. We know that we're dealing with percentages here, but when we first look at this, all we see is decimal places. And we have to move the decimal over two figures to the right to figure out what the actual percentage is. Luckily, we can format these values as percentages. So we're going to go back up to our number group and click this percentage symbol. If we give that a click, now we can tell that cost of goods sold is 38%, 1.5%, 
wages was 21% of the total, rent was 31%, and so on. But these percentages are not very accurate because they are rounded to the nearest whole number. So we need to increase our decimal places to achieve better accuracy. So once again, I'm going to select the cells in the percent of total column, come up to the number group, and click the command to increase percentages. I'm going to increase the decimal places by 2. And now instead of cost of goods sold being 38%, we know now it's 38.22%. So now these percentages are a lot more accurate and easier to read. And since we're trying to make our report look all nice and pretty, I'm going to select the cells that have the green triangle in the top left corner, and then come over to this warning symbol and select Ignore Error. And I'm going to repeat the process for the cells down here as well. All right, now that we have applied some formatting to the numeric values within our report, our report is looking a lot more professional and we know exactly what the values mean. All right, well, I know we talked a lot about applying different types of formatting options to the cells of our worksheet, but I do want to point out one very underused but efficient tool, which is the Format Painter. If we come up to our Home tab, under the Clipboard group, we can find the Format Painter command. The Format Painter is very similar to copying and pasting, but instead of actually copying and pasting what's inside the cell, it only copies and pastes the format of the cell, which includes the fill and text color, the border, and the number format of the cell. Let me show you an example. Let's say we want these row labels down here at the bottom of the report to have the same format as our column headings. First, we need to select a cell that has the format that we want to copy. So I'm going to click inside cell B3 because I want to get this background color and text color down to our row labels. So after we have our cells selected, I'm going to go back up to the clipboard group and select the format painter. And once we give it a click, we can see the marching ants around the cell that we're going to copy. And if you notice, now our cursor has a paintbrush tool next to it, which signifies that we are currently copying the format. So if I go back down to B11 and give this cell a click, watch what happens. Now the cell has the blue fill color, the white bold text, and the thick border on the top and left side of the cell, and the thin border on the bottom and the right side of the cell, just like cell B3. We can also use the Format Painter tool not to just copy and paste the format to a single cell, but also a range of cells as well. For example, let's click inside cell B11, because that's the cell that has the format that we want to copy, Go back up and click the Format Painter and select range B12 through B16. And once we let go, now all the cells have the exact same format. The borders look a little bit off to me, so I'm going to select these cells again and just apply a simple thin line around all the borders of the cell. So I'm going to select all borders. That looks a lot better. So I just showed how we can copy and paste the format for the text, fill color, and the border, but we can also use the Format Painter to copy the number formats of a cell. For example, let's say I want to copy and paste the exact same accounting format that we have up here in our report to this group of cells down here. So to achieve this, it's the exact same process. I'm going to click in the cell that we want to copy the format of, click the Format Painter, and then we're going to select the group of cells that we want to paste the format in and let go. Now our range of cells has the exact same format that we have up here. As you can tell, using the Format Painter is a very efficient tool and it saves us quite a bit of time because we mainly didn't have to go back into these cells and redo the processes that we did earlier to apply cell formatting. All we had to do is apply cell formatting once, then we can use the Format Painter to use it everywhere else in our spreadsheet. Not only does it save us time, but it also helps keeping the formatting consistent throughout our spreadsheet. All right, so over the past few videos, we have discussed many different options we could do to format cells. So now I want to introduce a very efficient feature inside of Excel, which are Excel styles. And styles can be located underneath the Home tab and in the Styles group. 
And the purpose of styles is to save formats that you previously done so you don't have to manually reformat different cells within your worksheet. We've discussed how to use the Format Painter to copy the same format to other cells within the worksheet. But if we use styles and we modify that style, anywhere we use the style within the worksheet will also get updated as well. So what we're going to do now is apply some styles within our worksheet so we can see what they actually do and get a better understanding on how styles work. So to start off, I'm going to come down to the lower half of our report and clear the formats for these row labels. So what I'm going to do is select the cells. And the best way to clear formats from cells is come up to the Home tab, go to the Editing group, click the drop down of Clear, and select Clear Formats. So now the cells are back to their original format, just with plain black text and no background color. Now the first step to create a style is to format a cell to your liking and then save that format. So what we're going to do is come down to cell B11 and I'm going to start to format this cell. So once again I'm going to make it bold, I'm going to apply a fill color of blue and white text. Alright now that I have the cell formatted the way I want, now it's time to save this format. So I'm going to make sure I have the cell selected come up to the Home tab, and in the Styles group, I'm going to click this drop-down. These are all the predefined styles that Microsoft Excel provides for us, and if we hover over these styles, we'll see our cell give us a little preview of what that style is going to look like. But to save the style that we just created, we're going to come down to New Cell Style, and we can give it a name. I'm just going to call it Test Style. And down here we have different options of what we want to include in the style. For example, the first checkbox is the number format. Right now it's general. Now this is a pretty important option because let's take our dates up here for example. If we apply this style to the dates, it's going to change the number format to general instead of date. So it's going to mess up the format of our dates. If you're just going to apply the style to areas that just have text within the cells, then general will be okay. But if you have currency or date values within the cells and you want to apply the style to, your number formats will get changed. So keep that in mind. So for this example, I'm going to uncheck so it does not save the number format. The alignment's good, the font's fine. For the borders, I'm going to deselect the borders as well because I don't want to mess up any of the borders if I apply this style to different areas of our worksheet. I want to include the blue fill and the protection is locked. So I'm going to click OK. Now if we look up here in our styles group, we can see that our test style has been added. So if I want to apply this style to different areas of the worksheet, I can select the cells that I want to apply the style to and then click our style. And then now I'm going to select these cells again and then just add our border to it. And then I can also apply this style to our column headings at the top of our report. So I'm going to select the cells, click Test Style, and if you noticed, all the borders and the date format stayed intact because we unchecked those boxes when we saved the style format. Now I'm going to show you why using styles is very efficient. Let's say you had dozens of worksheets and you had this blue style with white bold text. But for some reason, let's say the client you built the spreadsheet for, or your boss wants to change something, they're like, ah, we don't really like the blue, we want to turn it into a green color. Well, if we didn't use styles, we would have to go through each worksheet and select all the cells that had the blue format and manually change it to green. But if you use styles, you can modify the style and it will update everywhere you use that style within your workbook. For example, Right now we have the current style in our column headings and our row labels down here. Now instead of this blue color, let's say we want to change it to a green color. We can go up to our style, right click, and click modify. We can click the format button, go to the fill tab, and instead of blue, we're going to change it to green. If we click OK, watch what happens. Now everywhere we use that style has been changed to green. 
Now, the reason why this cell didn't change to green is because I accidentally left out applying the style to this cell. But very simply, I can just click the cell and select the style. And then now it's green. So you can see that using styles is a very efficient tool and can save us a lot of time formatting cells if we need to modify the format. And very simply, if we want to change it back to blue, once again, right click the style, click modify, go to format, go back to our original blue color and click OK. OK again. Now everywhere we use that style has been updated to the correct format. Once you start formatting cells within your workbook to make it look all clean and organized, you may come across a time where you want to center a piece of text over a certain portion within your spreadsheet. For example, let's take a look at our title. I think it would look nice if this title was centered over this portion of this report. To do that, we can use the merge and center command. So the first step is select the cells that you want to merge together, which is cells B1 through G1, which is the width of our report. Then we can come up to the home tab and within the alignment group, we can click the merge and center command and watch what happens. It merges all the cells together and centers our piece of text within those cells. Now our title is centered over the report. And even though we merged these cells, we could still come up to the alignment group and select align right, align left, and the cells will stay merged. But for now, I want to keep the text centered. So that's merge and center, but there's another command similar, which is merge across. So let me show you that so you can see the difference. I'm going to come down to row 11, select the row, and press Control plus or command plus if you're on Mac to enter a few rows. And let's say we want to have a notes section underneath this report. So in cell B11, I'm going to type in notes. And then in the next cell over, I'm going to type, this is a test note to utilize merge across. Also, Excel formatted this cell because it saw us use this gray fill color up here, so I applied it down here as well. I don't want this cell to be gray, so I'm going to come up to our fill bucket and click no fill. Okay, so as of right now, we have our notes down here, and I want to put an outside border of these notes. So I'm going to select outside borders, and you can see that the text in cell C11 is overflowing across the rest of these columns. Well, to make it fit all in one cell, we know that we can come up here between column C and D and auto adjust the width of it to make it fit. But now our January column is way too wide and messes up the look of our report. So I'm going to press Control Z as in zebra to undo that action. And instead of auto adjusting the width of the column, I'm going to select the cells that we want to merge. And we could click Merge in Center and just align it left, or undo that, click the drop down, and select Merge Across. So now our note fits all within one cell, and our border got a little bit cut off, so if we select the cell, put the outside border, now we can have a border around the whole cell. So using Merge and Center or Merge Across just adds a little bit more versatility when we're formatting our spreadsheet to make it all look clean and organized without messing up the width of the cells beneath the merge or above the merge. All right, over the past few videos, we've learned how applying cell formatting makes it easier to read our data. And for this video, I want to introduce to you conditional formatting. Conditional formatting is just another way for us to visualize our data and make our worksheets easier to understand. Currently, we only have about five rows of data. But if we had thousands of rows of data, it would be extremely difficult to see patterns and trends just examining the raw information. The special thing about conditional formatting is that it allows us to automatically apply formatting to one or more cells based on a cell value. For example, let's take a look at our percent of total column. Let's say we want to flag cells that are greater than 25%. 
so we can easily see which expenses are taking up most of our total. So to apply conditional formatting, the first thing we need to do is select the range of cells that we want to apply the format to. And then we're going to go to the Home tab, and within the Styles group, we can click Conditional Formatting. And within this dropdown, there are many different rules that we can choose from to tell Excel when to apply the format that we want. And for this example, we want to tell Excel to highlight a cell if our percent of total is greater than 25%. So I'm going to go down to Highlight Cell Rules and select Greater Than. And for the first box, Format Cells That Are Greater Than, I'm going to type in 25%. And currently the format is light red fill with dark red text, and we can see that up here. I'm going to select this drop down, go to custom format, select the fill. I'm going to select more colors and I'm going to select this light red. Click OK and click OK once again. One more time. Now the cells that are greater than 25% are filled with a red background color. So when we're looking at this report, we can automatically see that cost of goods sold and rent is well over 25% and it just draws our eyes directly to those expenses because we know that, hey, these expenses are taking up most of our total. And to get some more practice in, let's do another rule where it highlights a cell with a green color if it's less than 10% of the total. So once again, we're gonna select the cells that we wanna apply a rule to, go up to conditional formatting, we could select highlight cell rules again and select less than, but I also want to show you a different option so you can just get used to working inside the conditional formatting rules. So this time we're going to go down and select new rule. And now we have a list of all these different rules that we can choose from, but I'm going to select use a formula to determine which cells to format. And down here in this formula bar, format values where this formula is true. I'm going to select the first cell of our selection, then type less than and equal to 10%. And right now we have no format set, so I'm going to select format and give it a green fill color. Click OK and OK once more. Hmm, well, we can definitely see that our supplies and utilities is less than 10% but the green fill color did not get applied. So let's see what happened there. I'm gonna go back up to conditional formatting and select manage rules. Currently it says show formatting rules for current selection. I'm gonna change this to show rules for this entire worksheet, just in case we don't leave out any rules. I wanted to show you this method as well because sometimes applying cell formatting rules might not be as simple as the predefined rules Excel provides for us, such as the first one when we did cell value is greater than 25%. There's gonna be a lot of cases where you're gonna to need to use a formula to format a cell. And in our formula, it says that G4 is less than or equal to 10%. And it's applied to our whole range, which is the percent of total column. Well, to fix this, this goes back to when we talked about relative versus absolute cell references. Because currently in our formula, G4 is an absolute reference. So when it gets filled down to the rest of the cells, G4 is remaining constant. And right now, G4 is 38%, so it's not less than 10%. That's why none of the cells got applied a green fill color. So we need to edit this formula just a tad. So we're going to select our rule, click edit rule, and instead of G4 being an absolute reference, we're going to change it to a relative reference. And if we click OK, and OK once more, now our cells that are less than 10% are formatted with a green fill color. And the great thing about conditional formatting is that it automatically updates if your values change. For example, if I go to supplies, and I just put in $3,000, it should go over the 10% of the total. And now our percent of total of supplies went from a green fill color to a red fill color. I'm gonna undo that action, go back to our original amounts, and once again, it changed. 
So you can see how conditional formatting is a very powerful tool to help us visualize our data and make it easier to understand because it helps draw users' attention to values that are very important to our data. All right, now that we've built a pretty good foundation on how to format cells to make our data easier to read and more organized, in this video, we're gonna to start to add some images and shapes just to grab the user's attention a little bit more. The first thing I'm gonna show you is how to insert an image into our spreadsheet. So what we need to do is come up to the Insert tab, and within our Illustrations group, we can select Pictures. And from here, we have a few different options. We can select an image that is on this computer, but for this example, I'm gonna search for one online. So I'm gonna click Online Pictures. Then we can search for anything we want that has something to do with our spreadsheet. And in this case, we're dealing with a report. So I'm gonna search for Report Clip Art. And then we can start to scroll to search for a picture that we like. Um, this one looks nice. So I'm going to select this image and click insert. The image is pretty big right now. So to resize the image, we're going to move our cursor to one of the endpoints of the image until our cursor turns into a diagonal double arrow. And I'm going to click and drag to the appropriate size that I want. So that's about right. And then I'm going to move it up to the top of our report. And this image doesn't look very good against a white background. So what I'm going to do is select our title cell and fill it with a blue and make the text white. And then I'm going to increase the row height a little bit to fit that image that we put in there. There we go. Then I'm going to put the monthly expenses text in the center of the row height. There we go. And now that we have increased the row height a little bit, we have a little bit more room to increase the font size. And one last thing, I'm going to put a bottom border. Let me click out of the cell so we can take a look. And that's looking pretty good. So that's how you insert images. Now I'm gonna show you how we can insert shapes. So once again, we're gonna go back to the insert tab and then we can click the drop down of shapes. Now we're presented with a whole list of shapes that we can choose from. Now I'm gonna go down to lines and select this arrow. So let's just say I wanna point out the rent expense. I'm gonna click and drag to create our shape. And if I let go, we are presented with an arrow. But the arrow looks very thin, small, and is facing the wrong direction. So we need to format this arrow a little bit. So if we click the shape, if you notice, a new tab appears up in the ribbon called Shape Format. And this is where we can edit the format of the shape. So first, let's fix the thickness of the arrow. So we're gonna click Shape Outline, go down to Weight, and we can adjust the thickness of the arrow. I think six looks good. To change the direction of the shape, we can click on one of the endpoints and drag it to make it face the other direction. And we can move the shape by clicking and dragging the shape and then placing it where we want it. So right about there. And instead of having a blue arrow, I'm gonna change this arrow to a red color. So I'm gonna come up to the shape styles group. Now sometimes shapes have a fill that we can change and an outline that we can change. But technically, this shape is a line, so our only option is Shape Outline. If we give that a click, we can adjust the color. So I'm gonna select red. And now once a user looks at this report, that arrow really draws their attention to look at the rent expense. So to get more practice in, let's go back to the Insert tab, go to Shapes, and this time, let's select a rounded rectangle. And then we can click and drag to create the rectangle to the appropriate size and let go. And the neat thing about shapes is that they can also be text holders. 
For example, if we double click inside this shape, we can start typing. For example, let's say down the road, the purpose of the shape is that we're gonna make it into a button. So we can type in button and we can format this text just like we format text within the worksheet. We can change the text fill or outline within the word art styles group, or we can come back to our home tab. Let me just click the actual button itself. And then we can make the button text bold, increase the font size, and center it within the rectangle. We can also apply more formatting to the shape as well. If we go back to the shape format tab, we can change the color of the shape by going to shape fill and maybe selecting more of a light blue color. And right now there is a dark blue outline. So you can change the outline to a different color or no outline at all. And then we can also apply shape effects. So if you give this a click, we have all these different effects that we can apply, shadow, reflection, glow, and so on. For this example, I'm going to go to preset and click preset number two. This gives the rectangle a little bit more of a beveled look, so it appears more like a button that we could press later. There's also a lot of different properties that come with this shape as well. And we can edit those properties by giving the shape a right click and go to size and properties. Here we can adjust the size of the shape such as height and width or if we click this arrow next to properties to expand the properties we have multiple options to choose from. Currently one of the properties is set to move and size with cells. So what does that mean? So if I come back to our worksheet and I increase the height of row 3 watch what happens to the button. The button expands as well. So if you don't want your shape to change sizes while you're changing the size of rows or columns, what you want to do is make sure you select either move but don't size with cells or don't move or size with cells. Let's select the second option first, move but don't size with cells. So now if I come back to row 3 and increase the row height, now our shape size stayed the same. But if I add a column, or a row, the button will move with the rows or columns that we add or delete. So I'm going to undo those actions. And if you don't want your button to move at all, you can come back to the properties window and select don't move or size with cells. So no matter what we do, if we come in here and add rows or columns, the button will not move. And one of the last properties I want to talk about is the print object. So as of right now, if we come up to File, Print, our shape shows up on our print preview. So if I come back and deselect this print object and then go back to File, Print, now our shape does not show up on our print preview. Therefore, it will not print. So those are some basic formatting options that we can apply to our images and shapes that we insert into our spreadsheet to make our spreadsheet a little bit more presentable and to help draw users attention to certain areas within our worksheet. All right, so for this video, we're going to be talking about icons. Before we start, I do want to mention that icons are only available in Microsoft Excel 365. So if you don't have Office 365, you're still welcome to watch this video just to learn a little bit about icons, or you can skip on to the next video. All right, well, icons can be found in the same location where we inserted images and shapes, which is up here in the Insert tab. And inside the Illustrations group, there is a button labeled Icons. If we give that a click, And as you can see in this gallery, we have a lot more icons to choose from than shapes. And we can search for anything that we are looking for. And icons and shapes have a lot of similarities, but icons is a little bit more versatile. Now let me show you what I mean by that. If we keep scrolling and find an icon that we want, let's say this arrow right here. We're going to select the arrow and click insert. 
And once we have our icon inserted, we do have a new tab appear on our ribbon, which is the graphics format tab. And this is where we can format our icon. So once again, we can change the fill of the icon, the outline and the effects. But the neat thing about icons, this is where the little bit of the versatility comes in, is that we can convert this icon into shapes. So if we come up here in the ribbon and select convert to shape, some icons are built with a combination of shapes. For this icon, for example, we have a rectangle and two arrows. Now that we converted this into a shape, I can click on one of these individual shapes and format them. For example, if I click on just this one arrow, I can start to edit this individual piece. So if I just wanted to change the fill color of this first arrow to an orange color, I could do that. And maybe the second arrow, I want to change the color to a blue. So that's one of the main differences between icons and shapes. With icons, we can convert them into shapes so we can edit different parts of the icon individually. Now I'm going to insert another icon to show you another difference between icons and shapes. So I'm going to go back up to the insert tab, click icons, and I'm just going to select this contact book icon and click insert. We know that we can change the fill color of the icon, but if we want to get creative, we can also change the color of the transparent parts of the icon. For example, on this contact book, this little cutout of a person is not just two white shapes together. It's actually a cutout. So let's say we wanted to make that person cut out a green color. What we could do is go to insert and select a shape. I'm going to select a rectangle. Then I'm going to make it about the same size of the contact book or just enough to fit the person. I'm going to change the color to a green color. Have no outline. Now if I click and drag and put it over the contact book, as we can see it's a little bit big so I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. Right there. And then we can give the shape a right click and select send to back. Now our contact book has a little bit of color to it. Currently we have a shape and an icon on top of each other. And if we want to move these together where they both move at the same time, what we can do is select our shape, right click to bring it back to the front, place it over the person cutout again, and then I'm going to press control and select our icon to select both the shape and the icon and give it a right click and select group. Now they're grouped together. Then I can send our green shape back. Now if I click and drag the icon and the shape move together. So once again, there's a lot of icons that we can choose from to make our spreadsheet look more appealing and we can see that they're a little bit more versatile than shapes, but both icons and shapes help provide more of a visual interest to the users that are working inside of our spreadsheets. All right, so since we're on the topic of adding illustrations to our workbook to make our spreadsheets a little bit more appealing, I wanna talk about adding smart art to our spreadsheets. Smart art can be found underneath the insert tab and within the illustrations group and we'll see a smart art command. And if we give this button a click, we are presented with a bunch of different graphics that we can choose from to make our data a little bit more compelling. Basically, smart art is a fancy visual representation of our information. Now, some graphics are better for displaying certain types of info. For example, if you're comparing the similarities and differences between three different products, then a Venn diagram would probably be the best use to display that kind of information. And then there's other graphics such as a org chart to show the hierarchy within your organization and others just enhance the appearance of a bulleted list. So I'm going to pick one of these graphics to show you how to work inside SmartArt. All right, so for this example, I'm going to choose this horizontal bullet list. Click OK. And now our graphic is inserted. And let's say we want to show the different stages of developing a product. I know this doesn't have anything to do with our monthly expense report, 
but I wanted to show you how to work inside of SmartArt. So to start editing the graphic, we can select the text inside the graphic and start to type. So we can title the first stage step one. And maybe step one is create an idea. And we can delete the text below this. And if you look at this dialog box over here, it is mimicking what we do inside the graphic. So whatever we do inside the graphic will show up here and vice versa. If we start to make changes in the dialog box, it'll make the change within the graphic. For example, let's say the next box we want to label step two. And to easily create a new bullet point, we can click enter on our keyboard. And to add a sub step, we can click tab on our keyboard to enter bullet points beneath step two. So let's say step two is research. Then I'm going to press the enter key on our keyboard and then type in planning. And if I click enter again, it adds a new sub step, but if we don't want this sub step, we can click shift tab to delete a step or press the backspace on our keyboard. We can navigate through these steps by also clicking the up and down arrows on our keyboard. And for the third box, I'm going to title it step three. Press the down arrow key on my keyboard and then maybe develop a prototype. Once again, I'm going to click the down arrow to go to the next box and title it step four. Down arrow. Let's say we will do product development. And then I'm going to select the down arrow and press the backspace on our keyboard to remove that step. And if you notice, as we are typing, the text automatically resizes itself to fit within the graphic. And I showed you how we can press shift tab or tab to promote or demote a sub step, but we could also come up here in the ribbon and click the command buttons as well. Let's say I want this product development text as a title instead of a sub step. I'll select the text and up here in the ribbon, I can click promote. Now it adds a new step with the product development being the title. Same goes for demote. If I select demote, it will go back into being a sub step. We can also move these steps up and down. For example, let's select step two. I can come up here to the ribbon and select move down and it'll switch step two and three. Or if I want to move step two back to where it was, I can select move up. So move up and move down rearranges the order of our steps. One of the neat things about SmartArt is that we don't have to stick with the design that we chose from the beginning. Because currently, right now, we have a horizontal bullet list. If I come back up here to the ribbon and select the layouts, we can change the layout of our graphic and it will keep all of our text in place. We can also apply some custom formatting to our graphics as well. So underneath the smart art design, we can click the command change colors. We can select any of these predefined colors or make our own colors as well. But in this case, I'm just going to choose this first colorful format. And then I can also change the style of these graphics by coming up here under smart art styles and choose a style that we want to place on our graphic. I think this one looks nice. Now our information is displayed in a compelling graphic. And this just helps our spreadsheets look a lot more organized and clean, and it helps to effectively communicate our data in a more presentable way. So play around with it so when the next chance you can use SmartArt comes around, you can create some compelling graphics so you can really impress the users of the visual representation of your data. Okay, so over the next few videos, we're going to be discussing how we can create, modify, and format Excel charts. And charts are a great tool to communicate data graphically. Currently, our report is pretty organized and we can see the cost of each expense per month. But at first glance, it's difficult to see the meaning behind our numbers. But by inserting charts, we can see the comparisons and trends much easier. So for this video, I'm going to be walking through the steps on how to insert a chart. The first thing that we need to do is select our data. So I'm going to select the column headings and the cost of each expense. 
I'm going to leave out the totals because I don't want to include them within our chart. Now once we have our data selected, we need to go to the Insert tab, and within the Charts group, I'm going to insert one of the most commonly used chart types, which is the Clustered Column Chart. So I'm going to come up here to the Column Chart and select the 2D Column Chart. Now that our chart is inserted, we can kind of see how it handled our data. It put each month on the x-axis. It gave a color to each one of our expenses for our legend and also graphed the amount of each expense for each month. So quickly looking at this chart, we can see that the blue bars are the highest one each month. And we can go down to our legend and realize that, oh, cost of goods sold is our highest expense for each month. Same thing goes for the smaller bars. We can tell that supplies and utilities have low cost for each month. So at first glance, we can easily interpret our data just by looking at this chart. Instead of manually having to go into our report and seeing how much each expense cost. Another thing that I want to point out is that our data and our chart is now connected. For example, if I come up here into our report and change the cost of goods sold in January from 1000 to 3000, we could see that our blue bar cost of goods sold in January skyrocketed because we increased the cost of that expense. If we go back to the original amount, now our chart updated again. With our data and charts being connected, gives us that more dynamic functionality that we look for in our spreadsheets. So you can see that having charts, it's easier to compare data, make assumptions, and communicate information more effectively. And in the next few videos, we'll discuss how we can apply formatting to Excel charts. Okay, so as we begin to start formatting our chart, the first few options I want to discuss is changing the chart design. And if you notice, if we click on our chart, two more tabs pop up in the ribbon that involve formatting options for our chart. I'm going to click on chart design. When we first inserted our chart, Excel gave us a pretty basic chart to go off of. But let's say we want to start changing the layout of this chart. If we come over here to the charts layouts group, and click Quick Layout, Excel provides us a few different layouts that we can apply to our chart. For example, if I start to hover over these, we can see that the chart elements, such as the title, the legend, the bars, data labels, and so on, start to change. And you can select any of these based on your preference. We also have the option to change the colors of the bars. Right now, it is selected to the default Microsoft theme, but we can hover over these different color schemes to get a preview of what our chart would look like. So if your worksheet had a blue theme and you insert a chart, you can change the colors of your bars to make it match your theme. And lastly, we can change the style of our chart. And once again, we can select a few different predefined styles that Excel provides for us. And if we start to hover over these styles, you'll see our chart change. And these styles focus more on the formatting of the chart, such as the background color of the chart, fonts, effects, and so on. So it's up to you to choose a style that you think looks best with your worksheet. I know that this was a pretty quick video, but I wanted to introduce you to how to change the chart design before we actually get into formatting the elements of the chart in the next video. Alright, now that we discuss how we can change the chart design, now we are going to start formatting the elements of this chart. And what I mean by elements is the chart title, the X and Y axis, the legend, data labels, the data bars, the background color, and so on. So to start formatting these elements, what we have to do first is select our chart, and then we can come up to the Format tab in our ribbon. And you should be pretty familiar with this Format tab because it has a lot of the same groups when we were formatting shapes. All right, the first thing we are going to do is change our chart title. Because when users see our chart, they need to know what the chart actually means or what the chart is trying to tell us. So to change the title, all we have to do is click on the title and we can change the text. So I'm going to title this monthly expenses. 
All right, now that we got our title in there, I'm going to make our title bold so it really sticks out to the user. So once again, I'm going to select the title, come up to the Home tab, and select the bold command. Now that title really pops. And I'm going to make the text in our legend bold as well, just so that our expenses stand out a little bit more. So all I have to do is select our legend and select the bold command once again. All right, well, I think that looks good. And, and I think there's too much white going on inside of our chart, so maybe we can add a background color. So I'm going to go back up to the Format tab, and to change the background color, I can click this drop-down underneath Shape Styles. Oh, right now my legend's still selected, so that's why it's only applying the color to our legend. So if we just select the chart, and then come back up, now it's changing the fill color of the chart. But I don't want to change the whole background color of the chart. I just want to change the background color of where the data bars are. So I'm going to select the background where the data bars are and then come back up to our shape fill and then maybe apply a little gray tone to it. That's looking good. But we can also change the color of one of our data bars. For example, this gray bar kind of clashes with the gray background that we just placed. So all we have to do is select on one of the gray bars and you can see that it will select each series. And then we can go back up to shape fill and then maybe choose a green color. So it really stands out a lot more. And next what we can do is add data labels to our data bars. Because right now it's hard to see what the exact values are of these data bars. For example, let's take wages in January, this orange bar, we know it's somewhere between 400 and 600. If we hover our mouse over it, it will tell us that the value is 500, but let's say we want that value displayed in our chart. So what we can do is come over to this plus sign and give it a click, and then we can check the box that says data labels. So now we actually have the values above each data bar. And if we click this side arrow, we can change the location of these data labels to maybe the inside in, inside base, outside in, whatever you think looks good within your chart. I think the outside in looks pretty clean, so I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to increase our chart size a little bit just so we get a little bit more space between our data bars and data labels. Okay, well, I think that looks good. But now that we actually have the actual values above our data bars, there's really no need to have this y-axis for the cost of the expenses. So to remove this axis, we can do it one or two ways. We can either select the axis and click delete on our keyboard, or we can go back up to this plus sign and uncheck the bar that says axis. And that will get rid of it as well. And it's totally based on your preference if you want to have an axis there or not. And then lastly, let's say I want to take our legend and move it up to the top. So it's a little bit easier to read from top to bottom. I can go over here to our legend, select our arrow, and then I can select where I want to place the legend, either the bottom, left, top, or right. In this case, I'm going to select the top, and I think that looks good. And I just realized that when I uncheck the box of axis, I got rid of our X axis as well. I want to keep the months on the X axis so we can tell what each set of data bars mean. So I'm going to go back up to axis, check it, and if I expand our options, I can select the axis that we want to keep or remove. I'm going to get rid of the vertical axis so it keeps our horizontal axis intact so we can tell that this set of data bars is January, this set of data bars is February, and so on. So that's pretty much the basics of formatting a chart. When it comes to formatting charts, you can go a long way with it. So when you find time to mess around with charts, I strongly suggest doing so because you can really get into formatting the data labels or expanding the width of the data bars and so on. And you can format each element of the chart by selecting which element you want to format. For example, let's say I want to format the X axis. I can select it and give it a right click and click format axis. 
but you can do that with any element. For example, if I want to do edit the data bars, give the data bars a click and then give it a right click and select format data series or format data labels. So you have a bunch of different options that you can do when it comes to formatting charts. But for now, I think this formatting suits our chart. And in the next video, we'll talk about how we can modify the data within the chart and change the type and location of the chart. Okay, so now that we've got a basic understanding on how to change our chart design and format our chart elements, now I'm going to start discussing how we can modify the data within the chart, change the chart type, and show how we can move this chart throughout our workbook. The first example I'm going to show you is the switch row slash column feature. Currently on our x-axis, we have the months, January, February, and March. And within those months, we have five different expenses, which is included in our legend. If we select this chart, you can see that our x-axis, our months, are our columns. And our expenses in our legend are located in the rows. So to switch this around, it's a very simple process. All we have to do is select our chart, come up to the chart design tab, and select switch row slash column. If we give that a click, now our expenses are located along the x-axis and the months are used in our legend. So the blue bar is January, the orange bar is February, and the gray bar is March. So depending on how you want to view your data, you can select the switch row slash column command to change how your chart displays your data depending on your needs. And I'm just going to select this command again to go back to the original. We can also modify what data gets displayed in our chart. For example, let's say we only want January and February within our chart and we only want to look at cost of goods sold, wages, and rent. There's two different ways to do this. The first option is to select our chart. And over here in our report, we can change the area of the data selected. So if we only want January and February, we can move our cursor to one of the endpoints, click and drag to where it only shows January, February. And if we only want to show cost of goods sold, wages, and rent, we can click and drag and only include those. And you can see that our chart updated to only show January, February, and those three expenses. So that's the first option. The second option is to select our chart, come up to the chart design tab, and select select data. Now from here, instead of clicking and dragging to resize the data that we want to show, we can simply just select the checkboxes of the data that we want to show. So if we only want to show January and February, we can deselect March. And if we only want to show cost of goods sold, rent, and utilities, we can deselect wages and supplies. And if we click OK, now our chart only shows January, February, and those three expenses. Personally, I like the second option better because if you try to change the area of your selected data by clicking and dragging, it's a little bit more time consuming if you're trying to show data that is in non-contiguous cells because you would have to press control click several times to get the correct data you want in your chart. So it's a little bit more time consuming. But the second option is very simple and efficient and all we have to do is click select data and we can reselect the checkboxes to include the rest of our data. Okay, let's say you insert a chart, you did some work on it, but then you run into a situation where you need to change the chart type. Luckily, you don't have to start over from scratch. All you have to do is select the chart, come up to the chart design tab, and select change chart type. Currently, we have a clustered column chart, but let's say that you need to change it to a bar chart. We can select bar and click OK. And if you see that all of our formatting stays intact, so we didn't lose any of our formatting work that we did previously, but instead of a column chart, it is now a bar chart. I'm going to press Control Z as in zero, or Command Z if you're on Mac, to undo that action to get us back to our original column chart. Now the last thing I want to show you is how we can change the location of this chart, because currently we're on our report sheet. 
we could make this chart have its very own sheet to itself. And to do that, all we have to do is select the chart, come up to the Chart Design tab, and select Move Chart. And then we can choose where we want the chart to be placed. Let's put it on its own sheet. So I'm going to select New Sheet and click OK. So now our chart is on its own sheet and it gives us a lot bigger view of the chart. And if we went to go print this workbook, Excel would print our report page and then have this chart on its own piece of paper. And even though that we moved this chart to its own sheet, our chart and our data is still connected. So if we change anything in our report, it will still update this chart. And to move the chart back, we can select Move Chart and select Object in Report on our report sheet and click OK. So now our chart is back on our report sheet. Another way to move this chart is to use cut and paste. For example, if I press Control X on my keyboard to cut, or Command X if you're on Mac, and let's say I want to put it on a new sheet, I can create a new sheet and use the shortcut Control V as in Victor to paste it. Now our chart is secluded on sheet one, but once again, the data from our report and our chart is still connected. So that's the basics on how we can modify the data, change the type, and the location of a chart. Okay, now that we're a little bit more familiar with creating, formatting, and modifying charts, I want to discuss a different type of chart, which is the pie chart. Pie charts are a popular way to show how much individual amounts contribute to a total amount. So for our case, our individual amounts are the total cost of each expense and our total amount is all the expenses added together. One important thing to remember when inserting pie charts is that they only use one data series, meaning that you cannot have multiple columns of data that have numeric values in them. Pie charts are one to one. So we have our row labels for each expense and the percent of the total of each expense. So to create a pie chart, we're going to select our percentages and that's it. And then we can go up to the insert tab and select the pie chart. I'm going to move these charts around so we have a little bit extra space to work with. All right. Well, first things first, let's take a look at our legend. Right now we just see one, two, three, four, and five. We need to change this to show our expense labels. And to do that, we select the chart and underneath the chart design tab, we can click select data. And if we look under the horizontal axis labels, it says one, two, three, four, and five. So we can edit these by selecting edit and then selecting our label range, which are cells B4 through B8. And we can click okay. Now we have our expense labels in our legend. So that's good. And we talked about changing the chart title to give a better meaning of what our chart is trying to display. So I'm going to change the title to percent of total. There we go. Now that we got our title and legend correct, this chart doesn't really give us a lot of info about each expense. We can tell that the cost of goods sold takes up a big portion of the total, but how much? So this is a great opportunity to add some data labels to our chart. So we can come up here to the plus sign and click data labels. So now we know that cost of goods sold is 38.22%. Now this chart was pretty simple to create because we already had a percent of total column that calculated the percentages for us. But what if we didn't have that column? Could we still make the pie chart? The short answer is yes, but let me show you just in case you run into this situation. So this time, I'm going to select the totals of each expense, and then I'm going to press the control key to select our row labels as well. Go up to the insert tab and insert the pie chart. And since we selected our row labels prior to inserting the chart, our row labels show up in our legend. 
Now if we add data labels to our chart, let's see what happens. Well, instead of getting a percentage, now I'm getting the actual total value of the expense across the three months, which may be fine, but usually when dealing with pie charts, you're talking about percentages. So to change these values to percentages, we need to do some formatting to our data labels. So I'm going to click on one of the data labels within our chart and then give it a right click and select format data labels. Now over here in this format window, there is a checkbox that says percentage. If we give that a click, now it's showing the value and the percentage. So if we want to get rid of that value, we can deselect value to only show the percentage. Now once again, the percentage is rounded. So if we want to get those decimal places to have a more accurate value, we can go down to the number format and in this dropdown, we can select percentage. And we can tell Excel how many decimal places to include. It automatically includes two. So instead, cost of goods sold being 38%, it's showing 38.22%, which is a lot more of a precise value. So that's how you get percentages within your pie charts if you don't have a percent of total column. So that was a little taste of creating, modifying, and formatting Excel charts. And you can see that utilizing charts is a very efficient tool to visualize our data graphically, which makes it a lot easier to understand our data and spot comparisons and trends within our information. Okay, so over the next couple of videos, we will be discussing a bunch of different printing options inside of Excel. Printing spreadsheets may seem simple at first, but sometimes the page break splits in weird places or you might not be able to get everything on a spreadsheet on a single sheet of paper. But the good news is, is that Excel provides a lot of different settings that we can change so when we go to print our spreadsheets, they will look good on a sheet of paper as well. So the first step to print a spreadsheet is select the file tab and then click print. And you should be a little bit familiar with this window working in other office applications such as Word or PowerPoint because they all share the same printing window. From here we can select the amount of copies we want to print. We can select the printer and the printer properties and change a variety of different page settings. So without changing any of the settings, Let's take a look at our print preview. Currently, it looks like our report is good, but if we come down to our chart, it looks like the edge is a little bit cut off. So right now we're viewing page one. Let's see what's happening in page two. I'm gonna give this arrow a click, and now we can see that our arrow is actually cut off, part of our chart, and the pie chart is getting printed on a different sheet. If we wanna make all of this fit on one page, we can by changing some of the page settings. So I'm going to go back to page one. So one of the settings that we can change to get more space on our page is to change the page orientation. Currently it's on portrait. If we switch this to landscape, now our arrow is not cut off, but still our pie chart and column chart is still not fully on the page. So another thing we can do is change the scaling. Currently the setting is set to no scaling. If we click this drop down, we can select fit sheet on one page. So everything on the first sheet will be condensed to make it fit on this one page. If we give this a click, so Excel automatically adjusted the size to make everything fit on this page. Another option we can do to get some more space is to change the margins. Currently it's on normal margins. If we select this drop down, we can select narrow and that will help get everything closer to the edges of the page. Now if you want everything to be centered on this page, once again you can click on the margin settings, go down to custom margins, and then here we can select center on page horizontally and vertically. And if we click OK, now everything is centered on the page for a more organized and cleaner look. Now let's say that you don't want this pie chart to be printed out. We don't actually have to delete the pie chart off our sheet in order for it not to be printed out. What we could do is go back to our spreadsheet, 
select our chart, give it a right click, and select Format Chart Area. And then our format window pops up here on the right. And if we select the Properties button and expand the properties, we can deselect the print object, meaning that when we go to print this sheet, this pie chart will not get printed out. So let's see. First, we need to deselect the chart, go back up to the File tab, and select Print. Now our pie chart is not there, even though we didn't have to move it in our spreadsheet. And Excel saved all of our settings and automatically readjusted everything to be centered on the page. And one more thing that I want to point out, currently one of our settings is set to print active sheets, meaning it's only going to print the sheet that you have opened. If you have multiple sheets and you want to print every sheet, you can select this drop down and select print entire workbook. But in this case, we only have one sheet, so I'm going to just keep it to print active sheets. All right, now that we got a little bit of experience changing the settings within print preview, there's another view I want to discuss, which is called the page layout view. And to activate the page layout view, we have two different options. First, we need to go back to our spreadsheet and then we can select the view tab and select page layout. Or you can come down here to your status bar and select the page layout view. So if I want to go back to the normal view, I can just click the normal view. And if I want to go back to page layout, I can select page layout. So the page layout view is very helpful to enable the users to get a good overall feel of what the page is going to look like when it's printed. You still have all the functions you would have in the normal view, but with the addition of a few extra tools such as rulers, header and footer fields, and being able to change the margins directly on the worksheet. Now I do want to mention, although the page layout view is great for formatting, it's not always so helpful when you're working directly with your data. I personally like working in the normal view when I'm actually doing work inside my spreadsheet. But the page layout view is great for seeing what your sheet is going to look like when it's printed out. I'm going to zoom out so we can get a better look of what the page layout view consists of. And each one of these blocks is what's going to be printed on that page. Now this might look like you have multiple sheets, but it's actually just the report sheet. This is just showing how each page is going to get printed. For example, if I zoom back in, currently our worksheet orientation is on landscape because that's what we changed back in our previous video when we were dealing with the print preview settings. So let's say I want to change it back to portrait. We can do it inside of our spreadsheet. We can come up to the page layout tab, select orientation, and then click on portrait. So if we click file print as of right now, it will show our report and this chart on the first sheet of paper, and then this graph on the second sheet of paper, but it's going to be a little bit cut off. First, I need to right click this chart, go to format chart area and change the property back to print object so it gets printed out. So if you go to file, print, oh, the reason why it's only showing our chart is because we have our chart selected. So I'm going to go back to the spreadsheet, select anywhere but the chart, go back to file, print, and it's condensing everything because one of the settings in our previous video was to fit the sheet onto one page. So if I change the scaling back to no scaling, and currently if we look at this preview, it looks like our chart is getting cut off and on page two, we see some of our chart and then our pie chart. So if we go back to the page layout view, we can kind of move things around to fix this. So I'm going to scroll down select our chart and we can move and resize it a little bit to make it fit within the page. And for our pie chart, let's say we don't want it in the top left corner of this page. Well, we can increase the size without going over the border of the page. And we can also center it on this page. 
So now if we go back to our print preview, everything should be fitting within each page. So if I go to file, print, oh, our chart still selected, deselect our chart, go back to print preview. Now our first page, nothing is cut off and everything is centered. And if I go to the second page, we have our pie chart. So working in the page layout view, it is very easy to move things around within your spreadsheet so you can see how they're gonna be printed out without coming back to file print to look at the print preview and then make your adjustments. We can make our adjustments right there in our spreadsheet. Another feature that the page layout view has is adding headers and footers. So if we go back to our spreadsheet, I'm gonna zoom in here. We can select the top of the page to add a header and we can add a header on the left, middle, or right. For example, let's say we wanna have a title at the top of every page. We can select the middle section and start typing. Let's say that we just wanna title it monthly expenses. Now if I deselect out of the header, we have a title on every sheet that gets printed out. Another neat feature with Excel headers and footers is that if we come up to the header and footer tab, Excel provides us a few predefined elements that we can add, such as the sheet name, file name, file path, the date, the time, page numbers, and so on. So just for example, let's say we want to have the sheet name placed in our header. We can click on the command sheet name, and it puts a little formula in here that says ampersand sign tab, which will get the sheet name of the sheet that we're on. So if I deselect it, it says report. Same thing goes for the footer. We can add elements to the footer, such as the page number, and it will put a page number at the bottom of each page. So this is page one, and this is page two. So if I come back up to file print, we'll see that our, we have our title, our sheet name and our header, and our page numbers, and our footer. So working in the page layout view is great when you're formatting your spreadsheet because you can move things around and see exactly how it's going to be printed out without having to come to file print and looking at the print preview. Instead, we can make our changes directly on our spreadsheet. Okay, so by default, when you go to print an Excel worksheet, all the data on that worksheet gets printed. Now there might be a time where you only want to print certain areas of the spreadsheet. Luckily, Excel gives us an option to do that. There's two ways to do this. The first way is to select the cells that we want to print. So let's say that we want to print from our title and only down to the average. Once we have those cells selected, we need to come up to our page layout tab select print area and click set print area. Now if we deselect those cells, we can see a little border to show where our print area is. And then when we go to file, print, it's only gonna print what we set as the print area. Now I'm going to show you the other way. I'm gonna go back to our spreadsheet, go to the page layout tab, select print area and click clear print area. So now we don't have a print area set and our worksheet's back to normal. But once again, let's select those same cells. And this time, instead of setting the print area, we can go straight into file, print. And currently everything on the worksheet is getting printed out. But over here in our settings, we can select this dropdown and select print selection. So it's only gonna print out what we currently have selected in our worksheet. I'm gonna change this back to print active sheets and go back to our spreadsheet. Now if we only wanna print a specific chart, I touched on this very briefly in the previous video, but what we could do is select our chart that we wanna print, go to file, print, and it will only print that chart. I know this was a pretty quick video, 
but I did want to show you that you are able to print out certain areas of your worksheet. Because there might come a time where you need to show someone your spreadsheet, but some areas of your spreadsheet might have sensitive data or for some other reason you don't want them seeing parts of your spreadsheet. You can just select the area that you want to print out, which allows you to have more control over the areas that you want or don't want to be printed out. Okay, there is one more last thing I would like to talk about when it comes to printing Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. It is how to print a spreadsheet into a PDF file. Printing or saving Excel spreadsheets to a PDF file is actually very common because sometimes you don't want to just give an Excel file to certain users where they just have access to go in and potentially messing something up in your spreadsheet. It's also a great file type for attaching it in an email to send to clients or coworkers, but without them having access to the actual Excel file itself. So to print this spreadsheet out as a PDF file, there's two ways we could do this. The first way is going up to the File tab and click Print. And for the printer, you can select Microsoft Print to PDF. And if we went ahead and click Print, it would prompt us to give the file a name and choose the location on our computer to save the file. So that's the first option. Another way to save an Excel spreadsheet as a PDF file is clicking File, then Save As. And then here in our dropdown, we can select the PDF file format. And this way gives us a little bit more options. We can select More Options, then click the button that says Options, and then from here we can decide what we want to publish. Currently, it's selected to only publish the active sheet that we have open, which is our report sheet. But if we wanted to, we could convert just a selection of cells or an entire workbook. And if I click OK and select Save to save it to my desktop, I'm going to minimize Excel and then open up the PDF file that we just saved. Now our report looks just how it would on paper, but in a PDF file format. So we have our header up here, our report, and our charts. So converting your Excel spreadsheets to a PDF file to send to clients or coworkers is a great option because they don't actually have access to the Excel file and you have control over the areas of your spreadsheet that you want to publish to a PDF file. Okay, so before we actually get into the process of creating, opening, and saving an Excel template, I want to touch on the benefits of using an Excel template and how they are important to increase our efficiency. Excel templates are great for processes that are repeated often. Let's say we use this report every three months. Well, every three months, we don't want to start from scratch. So the basics of an Excel template is that it keeps all the formatting, formulas, page setup settings, everything stays the same, and we just plug in our numbers. Well, when people are creating similar spreadsheets, many of them will just open up an existing spreadsheet that they worked on before, delete the data that they don't want there, and then save it as a different file. Now, at times, that process might be okay, but if you had to make tons of different changes to get your spreadsheet back to its original starting place, this process can be a little time consuming. So with creating Excel templates, it will save us a lot of time because we can just open up the file and it'll have everything in order. We can just input our numbers and let our worksheet do the rest. And in the next video, we will get more into the details on how to create, open, and save an Excel template. All right, now that we understand the benefits of creating an Excel template, now we are going to start the process on how to create an Excel template. So to start off, we need to delete the data that's in the cells that we're going to be changing every time we come in and work on this report. So let's say we open up this report every three months or every quarter. What cells are we going to change? Well, the months are going to change, right? Currently, we're in the first quarter, January, February, March. The next quarter will be April, May, June, and so on. So since we are going to be changing the months, 
Let's delete our monthly column headings. I'm going to select my headings and click delete. Well, since we've deleted these months, now our template doesn't really give us any guidance. Because if we send this to a different user, how would they know to put the months there? So we can label these column headings month one, month two, and, oh, and month three. So now when a user opens up this file, they will know to enter the months in those column headings. All right, well, what other cells are gonna be changing every quarter? The cost of the expenses, right? So we can select our range and click delete. Now all of our formulas and charts are empty because it has no data to go off of. But this is technically the starting point of our template. So what we're gonna do now is save this current state of this spreadsheet as a template. To do that, we need to come up here to the File tab, click Save As, and maybe change the file name to Monthly Expense Template, Temp for short. And now this is very important. By default, when you save an Excel file, it saves it as a regular spreadsheet, which is a .xlsx. We need to change this file extension to an Excel template. So we have to click this drop down and go down and select Excel template, a .xltx file instead of an sx. So I'm going to give that a click. And by default, when you save Excel spreadsheets as a template, it's going to save the file underneath documents and custom office templates. You can change this location, but I'm going to keep it in here for now. So I'm going to click save. Now I'm going to close out of Excel so I can show you how to open up an Excel template. All we have to do is open up Excel and then we can click on the new tab. And if we look down here, we see all these other templates. But where's our template? Well, currently we're underneath the Office Templates tab. If we click on the Personal tab, our monthly expense template is here. So we can just give this a click. And now we have opened up our template and we can start inputting our numbers. So let's say this was the next quarter. So for month one, I can put in April 1st, 2020 and then May and then June and if you noticed our template saved our custom date formatting even though I put in 4 slash 1 slash 20 it changed it to the three month lettering and the four digit year and then we can start inputting our expenses let's say cost of goods sold was 750 for April a thousand for May and 975 for June and once we start to input numbers our charts will update as well and all of our accounting formats our conditional formatting rules all stayed intact and we didn't have to start from scratch all we had to do is input our values and our spreadsheet did the rest and I don't know if you noticed but if we look up here the title of our file is now monthly expense temp 1 so it knows that we are making changes to this template. So if we go to File, Save As, this PC, and I go to save this document, it's prompting me to enter a file name. And Excel puts the file type back to a regular .xlsx file. So Excel is actually preventing you from accidentally saving over your Excel template. So hopefully you see the benefits of using Excel templates because they actually save us a lot of time, especially for the processes that get repeated often. We can just start inputting values and our spreadsheet would do the rest of the work for us. Okay, so for the remainder of this section, we are going to be working inside this Excel practice file. So if you haven't already downloaded the practice file from the resources, I strongly suggest doing that now so you can follow along and practice as we go. 
once you have the file open, you will see many different sheets at the bottom of this workbook. But for this video, we will be working inside the Employee Data tab. So make sure that you have this sheet selected. Okay, so before we actually begin analyzing our data, it's important to know how to prepare your data for analysis. Currently on this sheet, we have a data set. And a data set is a range of contiguous cells containing data to analyze. And what I mean by contiguous is that there are no blank rows within our data set. So there might come a time where you export data from a different software application and import it into Excel to analyze it. And your data might look something like this. This data set provides information about each employee within an organization. And just for the record, all of this is completely randomized. But if we look in the first row of our data set, we see that we have column headings. So in column A, we have employee ID number, column B, first name, last name, email, and so on. These column names are called headers. And having headers for your data is very important because once we start sorting, converting data into tables, inserting pivot tables, and doing other calculations, Excel will identify these columns by the header. And not only do headers help Excel, but it also helps for your organization as well. So you know that in column A, it's the employee ID number. And in column I, we're looking at the zip code. I wanted to show you an example of a correctly formatted data set because having the correct format, the analysis will go a lot smoother. So if we scroll down through this data set, it's pretty short. We only have 49 rows of data. Well, actually 48 minus the header row. But if you notice, there are no blank rows separating the data. Really quickly, let me show you the potential problems when you do have blank rows within your data. So if I insert a blank row randomly inside our data set, and if I click a random cell within the top half of this list, and if I use the keyboard shortcut to select all, which is Control A or Command A if you're on Mac, it only selects the top half of this data set because now our data set is not contiguous. So Excel thinks there's two different lists. And let me show you the potential problems that can arise when our data set is not contiguous. For example, if I wanted to sort this list by the employee's first name, I would click inside our first name column, go to the data tab, and select the A through Z sort. So Excel sorted by the first name, but only for the top half of our data set, because from row two, to row 18, our first name is alphabetically sorted. But once it gets to this blank row, it stops and it doesn't sort the rest of the column. And that's why I wanted to take the time to show you that having a correct formatted data set is important once we start analyzing our data. All right, so for the next few videos, we will be working inside the sort filter sub sheet. Sub is short for subtotal. And this sheet is just a smaller example of a data set. And the reason why I made this data set smaller is just so that we're not overwhelmed looking at a lot of data and it's easier to follow along and actually see what's happening to our data once we start sorting and analyzing our data. So for this video, I'm gonna be talking about how we can use the quick sort command. And I briefly touched on this in the previous video, but I wanted to explain a little bit more about our sorting options and how sorting helps us analyze our data. So let's take a look at our data set. We have date, last name, cells, and region. We can sort this data set in many different ways, but we need to start thinking how we can sort this data in a way that would help us analyze it. Well, one of the ways that we could sort is by last name. So to sort a column, all you have to do is click any cell in that column within your data set, then go up to the data tab, and within our sort and filter group, we have three different sort commands. 
And let's say we want to sort the last name by alphabetical order. Well, we can click on the ascending sort command, which is the A to Z button. And if we give that a click, now all of our last names are sorted alphabetically. We have our A's, our B's, D's, and then E's. Pretty simple, right? Well, instead of analyzing by the last name, what if you wanted to analyze by the highest amount of cells to the lowest amount of cells? Well, we can click any cell in the cells column, go back up to our data tab, and then instead of ascending order, we'll select the descending order. So it goes from the largest amount of cells to the lowest amount. And if we give this button a click, now all of our cells are sorted from the largest amount to the lowest. We can easily see that in January, Evans had the highest amount of cells of 4,890 in the North region. And then in May, Evans had the lowest amount of cells at 536 in the West region. So depending on what you're trying to analyze within your data will affect how you sort your data to where you can easily find what you're looking for. Okay, so now that we got the hang of sorting one column at a time, I want to introduce to you a multi-level sort, meaning sorting multiple columns at the same time. In the previous video, we sorted by last name alphabetically, and we also sorted the cells column from largest to smallest. Let's say that we want to sort by the last name first, and then sort the cells from largest to smallest but keep the names in alphabetical order. The best way to explain it is to actually do it. So to start off, we need to go to our data tab and then click our sort command. Excel automatically selects our data. And then if we come down to our sort dialog box, the first thing that we want to sort by is the last name. So we can click this drop down and select last name. And once again, I wanted to point out the importance of having column headers because as you see here, our sorting options are based on our column headings. So we are telling Excel which columns to sort. So our first sort is going to be by last name and then we're going to select A to Z for ascending or alphabetical order. And then to sort by the cells, we can click add level, then by and we can use the drop down to select cells. And then we can change it to largest to smallest or however you want to sort. And if we click OK, now all of our last names are sorted alphabetically and our cells are sorted largest to smallest. But if we just take a look at the A's, we can see that Adam's largest cell was $4,819 and Adam's lowest cell was $787. And then when it gets to the B's, the cells column gets sorted largest to smallest just for the B's, then the D's and E's and so on. So we just completed a multi-level sort. And Excel allows us to sort up to 64 levels. Now, more than likely, you would never sort that many levels. But the important thing I want to get across is that we can apply multi-level sorting to our data to make it easier to analyze and pinpoint the data that we are looking for. OK, so we talked about a few different sorting options. We have done a single level sort and a multi-level sort. We can also apply custom sorting options to our data set. Let's say that we want to sort our list by the month. Well, we know that we have to select a cell within the date column, go up to the data tab, and click the ascending sort or the descending sort. Well, let's think about this. What's going to happen to our date column if we do an ascending sort? Let's find out. So if we give this command a click, well, it sorted all of our months, but in alphabetical order. So the first months are April and August, because they start with A, then it goes December, February, January, and so on. Well, even though that our months are grouped together, usually when we look at months, we want to see them in chronological order, meaning we start with January, February, March, and so on. Well, luckily, Excel has a feature that we can apply a custom sort to get our dates in the correct order. 
So the first thing we have to do is select anywhere on our list, doesn't matter where, go back up to the data tab and click the big sort button. So the column that we want to sort is the date column. And instead of having the order from A to Z as an ascending order, we can click this drop down and select custom list. So depending on our values in our date column affects which custom list that we need to select. So we would not want to select this custom list that actually spells out the full month. What we really want to select is the abbreviation of the months. And if we select OK, OK once again, now our months are in chronological order, meaning that they start with January, then February, March, April, May, and so on. So usually when it comes to date values, you can apply custom sorting. For this example, we did it with the months, but we could also do it with the days of the week. So it starts with Sunday, then Monday, Tuesday, instead of sorting them alphabetically. So applying custom sorting really allows us to analyze our data in the way that we want. So we talked about the advantages of sorting our data to group our data together and make it easier to find and analyze what we're looking for. For example, in the previous video, we sorted our date column to make our months go in chronological order. Well, let's say that we wanted to look at the cells of the month of March. Well, we can scroll down, find our March values, and look at the cells. Now, since this is a really short data set with only 27 records, what if we had thousands or hundreds of thousands of records it would be very time consuming to scroll down and find what you're looking for. So to start off, all we have to do is click a cell within our data set, go to the data tab, and inside the sort and filter group, we can click this big filter button. Now this doesn't change anything in our data set yet, but if you noticed, it added these drop down arrows on our column headings. Now this is another important reason that we have column headers within our data sets. Let's say that we only want to look at records within the month of March. That means we need to apply a filter in our date column. So if we select the drop down of our date column, we can choose which month that we want to display. So currently all the months are checked. So all the months are being displayed. But if we uncheck the select all, it unchecks all the months and then we can select the month that we want to look at. So for this case, we want to look at the month of March. So we can check March and click OK. So now our data set filters everything out except for the month of March. And we can see the cells for that month. We can also make multiple selections. What if you want to look at January, February, and March? We can go back to our drop down and select January and February and March is still selected. And if we click OK, now our data set is showing the records for January, February, and March. At the moment, we only have one column filtered, but we can keep that filter in place and filter another column at the same time. So for example, let's say I wanted to look at the first three months, January, February, and March, and only the region of North and East. So I can click the drop down in our region column and deselect South. And if I click OK, now our data set is showing January, February, and March, but only for the regions of North and East. Now currently, our date column and region column have this little funnel icon on our drop down. And this is just symbolizing that we have a filter in place on these columns. So to clear all filters within our data set, we can go back up to our data tab and within the sort and filter group, we can click clear. And this will remove all the filters. Now, depending on the values that you have in your columns, Excel offers some predefined filters as well. For example, let's take a look at the cells column. Our values are numbers. So if we click this drop down, it gives us all the values within that column. Now it really wouldn't do as much good 
if we filtered by a specific value. Now since the values within our column are numbers, Excel provides us an option for number filters. And here we can set what we want to look for. We can do equals to, greater than, less than, between, top 10, above average, below average, and even custom filters. And I strongly suggest playing around with these and practice filtering certain data. But as for a quick example, we can just select the top 10. And we can tell Excel to show the top or bottom items and the amount of items that we want to show. We can change this 10 to a 5. And if we click OK, now Excel filters our data to show the top five records within our sales column. Now, like I said, sorting is great because at first glance, our data looks all organized. But by applying filters, we can quickly see the data of our interest. Okay, so for this video, we will be discussing how we can expand the format of our data sets to easily reveal more information about our data. And one of the options to get more information easily available to us is to add subtotals within our data sets. So to add subtotals, there's a few steps that need to be taken. The first thing we need to do is clear our filters in our data set if you haven't already done so. So I'm going to click any cell within our data set, go to the data tab, and click clear. Now the next step is to sort the appropriate column you want to have a subtotal for. Now depending on what your needs are, you can sort any of these columns. But let's say that we want to sort by the last name and then create a subtotal to sum the amount of cells for that person. Hopefully once we get the subtotals in here, you'll have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So the most important step is to sort the column that you want to create subtotals for. And in our example, we want to sort by the last name. So what we need to do is click any cell in the last name column, come up to our data tab, and click the ascending sort command. Now if we take a look at our data set, all the atoms are together, then we have Brown, Davis, and then Evans. And our goal is to sum the amount of cells for each person. We could do this manually by inserting a row at the end of atoms, and then come to the cells column and add a sum formula. And there we go. Adam's total cells were $21,822. But could you imagine if you had thousands of records and manually go in, add a row, insert a sum formula to get the total amount of cells for that person? It would take forever, right? And this is where the subtotal command comes in handy. So I'm going to delete the row that we just inserted. Now that we have our last names grouped together, we can click any cell within our data set, come up to the data tab, and then all the way over here within our outline group, there's a subtotal command. If we give this button a click, a subtotal dialog box pops up and we have a few options to choose from. The first option is asking where we want to place the subtotal. At each change in the date column? No, we want to place it at the change of the last name column. So we can select this drop down and click last name. And the second option is asking which function we want to place for our subtotal. Well, we want to sum the amount of cells, right? So we wouldn't want to use count. We can click this drop down and select sum. But if you wanted to have the average, max, min, you could select those as well. But for now, we're going to select sum. And the third option is asking which column we want to add the subtotal to. Well, we can't sum region because the region column has text values. We want to sum the cells column. So we need to check cells and uncheck region. And if we click OK, Watch what happens. So at the change of the last name, it added a subtotal to the cells column and summed all the cells above this row. 
So once again, Adam's total was $21,822. And Brown's total was $17,570. And at the very bottom of our data set, it also gave us a grand total of all the cells combined. You might have also noticed these lines and squares pop up on the left side of our spreadsheet. This is just showing how Excel grouped our data. And we can select these boxes to hide or to unhide certain sections of our data set. For example, if I click this one up here at the top, it collapses everything in our data set and only shows the grand total. But if we click the number two, now it's just showing the total for each person, Adams, Brown, Davis, and Evans. And then if we click three, it's showing all the details of each person. So if you had thousands of records and you only want to see the total of each person, it's very easy to click these options to make our spreadsheet more condensed and see the totals that we are looking for. And then from here, you can also expand the details of each person if you want to have a more in-depth look. For example, if I want to take a look at each of Adam's cells, I can click this plus sign and it'll expand all of Adam's details. Same thing for Brown. I can click this plus sign and then all the details for Brown open up. So these little grouping command buttons off to the side of our worksheet easily allows us to look at the data of our interest. All right, so for this video, we will be discussing how we can convert our data sets into Excel tables. Excel tables allows you to analyze your data very efficiently, and it automatically comes with great functionalities like filtering, sorting, and adding total rows. So to show you some of these functionalities, we need to convert our data set into a table. The first thing we need to do is remove our subtotals if you haven't already done so. So I'm going to select a cell within our data set, come up to the data tab, click our subtotal command, and select remove all. Now to convert our data set into a table, we can select a cell within our data set or select the whole data set, it doesn't matter. Then we have to come up to the insert tab and click table. And in our pop-up window, we need to make sure that the checkbox is checked for my table has headers because it does. And we can click OK. And now we have so many great options that we can do with this table. Before, our data set just had plain black text against a white background. Now with the table, we actually have some formatting options. You can see that it formatted our headers to a dark blue background color with white bold text. And it also made each row a different color, so now our eyes can adjust and easily read through this data set. We can come up to our ribbon under table styles and choose a style that we prefer. We can go back to none, or if we want more of a darker color scheme, we can choose one of these down here. It's totally up to you. Tables have many different formatting options. You can also create your own formatting style to apply to your table. And if you notice, when we converted our data set into a table, Excel automatically put the drop down arrows in our column headings. And we've seen these before. We can use these drop down arrows to apply different sorting options and apply filter options as well. Another neat feature of a table is that we can come up to our ribbon and check the box that is labeled total row. And at the bottom of our table, it added a new row. And within this cell, right now it's showing a total of 27. But how did it get 27? If we click this drop down, the current function placed in this cell is the count function. So it's counting all the records within that column. Well, if we don't want the count function in there, we can select none. But let's say that we want to have a total amount of the cells column. We can click in this cell, click on the drop down, and select the sum function. Now Excel summed the whole cells column without us manually going into this cell and typing in the sum function ourselves. 
Now if you want to add more rows to this table, you can move your cursor to the bottom right hand corner of the table, and then you can click and drag down for how many rows you want to add. You can also add a row anywhere inside this table as well. For example, if you wanted to add a row between 15 and 16, I can select row 16 and then press Ctrl plus as a shortcut key to add a row. And it won't mess up the functionality of the table. I'm going to undo those changes. Now that we have our table in place, what if we wanted to add another column to our table? Well, I can click in the next cell next to region and we can add a percent of total column. So for my header, I'm going to type in percent of total. And if I click enter, Excel automatically knows that we're trying to add on to the table. Another neat thing about tables is how they handle formulas. For example, to get the percent of total for this record, we need to add a formula. So the first thing we have to do is type in the equal sign and then click in cell C2 and look what happened to our formula. Instead of using the cell reference C2, since we're working inside of a table, it just puts the header name of that column. And once again, that's why it's important to make sure that we have header names. Then we have to divide this amount by the grand total. So I'm going to press forward slash and then select the grand total. And once again in our formula, instead of using the cell reference, it put in a little piece of code referencing the total row at the bottom of the table for the cells column. And if we click enter, Excel automatically filled the formula down to the rest of our table. And since we used currency values within our formula, Excel was trying to be helpful to match that format. But since we want it in percent format, we can select our percent of total column, come up to the home tab, and within the number group, we can select percent. And then we can also increase our decimal places to get a more accurate reading. So that's the basics of an Excel table. As you just saw, there are many different functionalities that come with an Excel table, and this can save us a lot of time to analyze our data and also quickly apply formatting to our data sets. All right, so for this lecture, we are going to be discussing how we can find and remove duplicate values in our spreadsheets. Having duplicate values in your data can be a very big problem it can lead to substantial errors and overestimate your results. So it's always a good idea to double check and see if there's duplicated values within your data so you can ensure that you have an accurate report. The good news is finding and removing duplicate values is actually quite easy in Excel. If your data is formatted as a table, all you have to do is click anywhere inside your table, go up to the Table Design tab, and then within the tools group, we can select remove duplicates. And then our remove duplicates window pops up and we can select the columns that we want to search for duplicates in. Now this table doesn't have a really good example to show duplicate values. So what I'm going to do is cancel out of this. And instead, we are going to be working inside the employee data sheet. So let's go back down to our sheet tabs and select employee data. So when we are searching for duplicate values, we want to look in columns that have unique identifiers. And if we take a look at our data here, which columns do you think would have unique values? Well, the employee ID number should be unique to that one employee. So no employees should share the same ID number. So that could be a unique identifier. Another unique identifier could be the phone number. Every employee should have their own phone number. But for this example, let's work inside the employee ID column. Currently there are no duplicate values. So I'm going to go into this column and add some. So instead of employee number 1013, I will change this to 1012 to make a duplicate value. And then maybe down here at 1024, I'll change it to 1023. 
So now we know we have some duplicate values. But as of right now, if we just take a quick glance at this spreadsheet, we could easily miss those duplicated values, right? So to remove these values, we can click any cell within our data. And on this sheet, our data is not formatted as a table. So instead, we have to go up to the Data tab. And in the Data Tools group, we can select Remove Duplicates. Then Excel is going to ask us which columns that we want to look for duplicates in. So I'm going to unselect all the checkboxes and just check the Employee ID column. And if I click OK, Excel says that two duplicate values were found and 46 unique values remain. I'm going to click OK. And if we take a look at our data set again, now we only have one 1012 and only one 1023. But using that method, we are just blindly deleting duplicate values without knowing exactly what we're deleting. So what I like to do is actually identify the duplicates first, then delete the duplicate values just to make sure I'm deleting the correct ones. So I'm going to undo this action so we can get back our duplicate values. Now we have two 1012s and two 1023s again. Now this time, what I'm going to do is select the entire column, come up to the Home tab, click the Conditional Formatting button, select Highlight Sales Rules, and then click Duplicate Values. Then Excel asks us how we want to format our duplicate values. Well, we want to format a light red fill with a dark red text. We can change this, but that looks good for now. And we can click OK. Now we can easily locate our duplicate values. Now for this example, we have a pretty small data set, so it's easy to scroll and find those values. But if we had hundreds of thousands of rows, it would take some time to scroll through and look for those formatted cells. So what I like to do is apply a filter or sort in this column to put all the duplicate values together. So to do that, we need to make sure that we have a cell selected within the column, come up to the Data tab, and select the Filter button. Now we can click this drop-down arrow, and then from here we have two options. We can either filter by color, where we can only view the cells that have a light red background color. So if we select this format, now we only see these duplicated values. Or we can sort by the formatted cells and place them at the top. So if I clear that filter, click this drop down again, and click sort by color, choose the light red color, now our duplicated values are at the top of our list. And then from here, we can make the necessary changes to get the correct employee ID number. For example, if I change Melissa to 1013, now those cells become unhighlighted because there's no duplicated values. Or we can remove the duplicates. So I'm going to change Melissa back to 1012. Then come up to the Data tab and select Remove Duplicates. Once again, I'm going to unselect all the columns and only check the Employee ID column. Now one and very important thing to remember when removing duplicates is that Excel keeps the first duplicate value. For example, in our data, Brenda and Melissa both share the 1012 Employee ID number. Once we click OK to remove these duplicates, Excel will keep Brenda and delete Melissa. And then for the 1023 ID number, Excel will keep Gregory and delete Dorothy. So that's very important to keep in mind. Let's see what happens. If we click OK, two duplicate values were found and removed, 46 unique values remain, and if we look at our data, Brenda and Gregory stayed, but Melissa and Dorothy got deleted. So even though removing duplicate values in Excel is fairly easy and provides a more accurate report, we have to be cautious 
and make sure we are deleting the correct duplicate values. Because if we accidentally remove the wrong duplicates, that could lead to an inaccurate report as well. Okay, so for this section of the course, we will be discussing Excel database functions. And what database functions do is perform calculations on a range of cells, but we can provide conditions or criteria to tell Excel to only calculate the cells that meet our criteria. And for the next few videos, I want to point out that we will be working inside the D functions sheet tab. So make sure you have this tab selected. So before we actually get into the database functions, I want to introduce to you the sum if function. Because the sum if function and the D sum function basically do the same thing, but depending on different scenarios, one function may be more useful than the other. That's why I want to show you both so you can get a better understanding how both these functions work and know when it's the right time to use these functions. So what is the sum if function? The sum if function can sum the values in a range of cells that meet criteria that we specify. For example, let's say that we wanted to sum all the cells for a specific region. Well, based on a lecture earlier in the course, we can apply a sort to the region column to get all the regions grouped together and then add a subtotal. But if you don't need to do that, we could use the sum if function. So to start off, we need to enter our function in our spreadsheet. I'm going to click inside cell H3 because this is where we want our result to be. And then we should know by now that all functions and formulas start with the equal sign. And then I'm going to start typing sum if. I'm going to give this function a double click. And our little help bar shows us which arguments are needed for this function. But if you're not used to certain functions, sometimes you don't really know what these arguments actually mean. So to get a better understanding how this function works, I'm going to click this FX button up here near our formula bar. And we have seen this function arguments window before. And it tells us that the SUMIF function adds the cells specified by a given condition or criteria. So the first argument is the range, which is the range of cells that you want evaluated. So if we wanted to sum the total cells of a specific region, the range that we want evaluated would be the region. So I'm going to select the whole region column. And our second argument is our criteria. And it tells us that the criteria is the condition or criteria in the form of a number, expression, or text that defines which cells will be added. So basically, we are specifying which region that we want to add the cells for. So for example, if we wanted to add the total cells for the south region, I can manually type in south, or we can provide a cell reference. So instead of hard coding south into this formula, we can select cell G3. And whenever a user types in which region here, it will add the cells for that region. And then the last argument is the sum range, which are the actual cells to sum. So for this argument, we want to select the cells column because these are the cells that we want to sum. And if we click OK, Right now our answer is zero because in our formula we are referencing cell G3 for the region and we haven't specified the region yet. So if we want to sum all the cells for the north region, we can type in north and it will calculate the total cells for the north region. And if we want to change the region, all we have to do is click inside this cell and we can type in a different region and then it will give us the total of cells for that region. So that's the sum if function only using one criteria. But what if you wanted to apply multiple criteria? For example, let's say you wanted to add the total cells for the south region, but only for the month of April. Well, instead of using the sum if function, we can use the sum ifs with an s function. 
so we can state multiple criteria. So I'm going to select the cell where we have our function in, and then I'm going to search for the sum ifs function. I'm going to delete this out of our formula, and then double click the sum ifs function. I'm going to open up the functions argument window to get a better understanding of how this function works. Now it tells us that the sum ifs function adds the cell specified by a given set of conditions or criteria. So it sounds kind of the same of the sum if function, but here we can add multiple criteria. So the first argument for this function is the sum range, which are the actual cells that we want to sum. So I'm going to select the cells column because those are the values that we want to sum. And our second argument is criteria range one which is the range of cells you want evaluated for this particular condition. Well, our goal is to sum the total cells for a region, but within a specific month. It doesn't matter which order you put your criteria in. You can do the region first or the month first. I'm just going to do the region first. So I'm going to select the region column. And our third argument, criteria one, we are stating the criteria for our first criteria range. So our first criteria range was the region column. And for our criteria, I'm going to select our region cell reference, G3. And currently this criteria shows that it equals south because we have south written in this cell. And for our criteria range two, the cells that we want to evaluate is the month column. And the criteria for that range, I'm going to use the cell reference F3 for month. And right now this criteria shows that it equals zero because we have nothing written in this cell yet. So if I click OK, right now the total cell shows zero because our month is blank. But if we type in April for the month, we should get the total cells for the south region only for the month of April and the total comes out to $6,577. Now to double check just to make sure if our function is calculating correctly, I'm going to come over here to our data, select the drop down for region, and only show south. And then I'm going to select the drop down for month, and apply a filter to only show April. And if we select these cells, come down to our status bar, our sum shows $6,577, which is the exact same value that our function calculated. Now I'm going to clear these filters, come up to the data tab, and click the clear command. So the reason why I wanted to show you the sum if and the sum ifs function is to build a basic understanding how we can perform calculations based on certain conditions that we specify. So this was kind of like a preview to the database functions that we will be discussing in the next few videos. And then you'll be able to see the advantages and disadvantages between the two. But I believe knowing how to use the sum if and the sum ifs function is a very important tool to know how to use in Excel. And it can be very useful to your spreadsheets. All right, now that we have a basic understanding on what the sum if function does and how it works, it is time to introduce Excel's database functions. And the database function that we will be working with is the D sum function. And D is short for database. So to begin, let's duplicate this sum if setup for our D sum function. I'm going to select these cells, control C for copy, Come over here and control V for paste. And then change this heading to dsum. All right, for this example, we are going to try to achieve the same results that we got using the sum if function, but this time we are going to be using the dsum function. So once again, our goal is to sum the total amount of cells for a specific region. So let's click in cell L3 and start to insert our function. 
we have to type in the equal sign and then D sum. I'm going to give this function a double click and then come up next to our formula bar and click the FX button to open up our function arguments window. And Excel states that this function adds the numbers in the field or column of records in a database that match the conditions you specify. So very similar to the SUMIF function, we are trying to sum a range of cells that match a specific condition. But one of the differences between these functions are the arguments. So the first argument is the database, which is the range of cells that make up a list or database. So for this argument, we need to select our whole database. Now our second argument is the field. And the field is either the label of the column or the number that represents the column's position in the list. So in this case, we are trying to sum the total cells for a specific region. And the column that we are trying to sum is the sales column. So for the field argument, we can either enter a three because the sales column is in the third column in our list, one, two, three, or we can just select the column heading, which is cells. And lastly, our third argument is the criteria. And the criteria is the range of cells that contains the conditions you specify. The range includes a column label, and one cell below the label for a condition. So what does that last part actually mean? So up here in our sum if and D sum setups, there are reasons as to why we actually have these column headings in our setups, month, region, and total cells. The first reason is that it's organized and easy to read. And the second reason is that the D sum function actually has to have these column labels to perform correctly. So for the criteria, we actually have to select our column label and one cell below the label for the condition. Now that we have all of our arguments filled out, we can click OK. And currently, it's giving us a total cell of $73,630. And if we select our cells column and look at our status bar, we can clarify that these totals match. The reason why it's summing the whole cells column is because we haven't specified the region yet. So if we come up to cell K3 and type in the West region, now our total comes out to be $12,513. I'm going to apply the accounting format to this cell to make it a little bit easier to read. Now to double check to make sure that this function is working properly, I'm going to come over to the regions column, select our dropdown, and apply the filter to the west region. Then select our cells column, and the status bar shows a sum of 12,513. Then I'm going to go back to the data tab, clear the filters so we can see our formulas again, and we could see that the total cells for the West region was $12,513, which we saw in the status bar. And if we wanted to figure out the total cells for the North region, all we have to do is click inside our criteria and type in North. Now we have the total cells for the North region. So as you can see, we can get the same answers using both of these functions, but they just handle their arguments a little differently. As we just saw with the DSUM function, we had to build this kind of setup to have our column labels to apply the condition for the criteria argument. For the SUMIF function, we didn't have to use column labels at all. I just chose to because it's easier to understand what we are trying to sum. Now one very important thing to keep in mind when creating this column label setup for our DSUM function is that these column labels need to match our database column headers exactly. For example, we use the region for our criteria. So over here in our region column label, if we accidentally misspelled this column label, let's say that we forgot to put the O in region. Now we're getting a value of zero for our total cells. 
Now, sometimes it might not be that obvious. For example, if we edit this cell back to the correct spelling, but accidentally put a space and we press enter, our total cells will still come out to zero. Well, at first glance, when we look at this, it makes us wonder why the dsum function is not calculating the total cells for the north region. Because the column labels look the same, but this invisible space is what's throwing it off. So one useful tip that I suggest doing when creating your column labels is to not manually type these column labels. Instead, we can use cell references to reference our column headers. So for this column label, I'm going to type in the equal sign and then select the region header. And if I click enter, now our dsum function is working properly again. Let's do the same thing for the month. So I'm going to delete this out, type the equal sign, and select the month column header, and press enter. So using cell references to create our column labels helps us prevent any errors that could arise when using this function. So let's say for any reason, we changed our region header name in our database to just reg period, which could be short for region. Well, if we click enter, it still didn't mess up calculating the total cells for the north region because now that we have a cell reference in place in our column labels, our column labels changed to whatever we put inside of our column headers in our database. So we talked about how we can use the sum if function to sum a range of cells based on a condition. And then we took it a step further and used the sum ifs function to sum a range of cells based on multiple conditions. So now let's walk through an example on how to sum a range of cells based on multiple conditions using the dsum function. First, I'm going to change my region column header back to its original spelling. Then if we select the cell that includes our dsum function, which is L3, open up the function arguments window by clicking the FX button. And for our arguments, our database can stay the same, our field, which is the cells column, can stay the same, and the only thing that we have to change is our criteria. So for this example, our goal is to sum the total amount of cells for a region, but within a specific month. So instead of our criteria being K2 to K3, we can change this to include the month and region column label and the condition below the label. And if we click OK, let's do the same month and region as we did for the sum ifs function to see if we get the same total. So for the month, I'm going to type in April. And for the region, I'm going to type in South. And we get the same total of $6,577. So that's one of the advantages that the dsum function has over the sum ifs function. Because to go from one condition to multiple conditions, we didn't have to change functions using the dsum. Previously, if we only had one condition, we had to use the sum if function. But if we had multiple conditions, we had to use the sum ifs function. So here we didn't have to change the actual function. Another advantage that the dsum function has is that we can apply even more conditions to achieve a total that we're looking for. For example, let's say that we want to find the total cells for the south region in the month of April. And then we can also add maybe the month of October in the north region. And all we have to do is go back to our function and change our criteria range to include our column labels and all of our conditions. And if we click OK, now our dsum function is summing up the totals for the south region in the month of April and the north region in the month of October. To really see the advantage of the dsum function over the sum ifs function, let's try to achieve this same total with the sum ifs function. So let's match the dsum setup for our sum ifs setup. 
So I'm going to put October here and North here. All right, and then we can go to our sum ifs function, open up our function arguments window, and then by looking at these arguments, how are we going to tell Excel how to sum the total cells for the South region in the month of April and the North region in the month of October? You may be thinking we can add another criteria range and then give it a criteria. For example, if I scroll down here, and for criteria range three, we can select our region column. And for its criteria, we can select north. And then for criteria range four, we can select the month column. And for its criteria, we can select October. And you can see that our result is zero. So this is not going to work because what this function is looking for now is a single record or row in our database that has a region of south and north and a month of April and October. And not one record or row could have both of these months or both of those regions. What would work if you had multiple criteria ranges and some ifs, we want to sum the total cells of the south region in the month of April for the employee last name of Brown. That's how the sum ifs function works. But it's still possible to get the same total as the dsum function using the sum ifs function. Let me show you. I'm going to cancel out of this. And what we could do is combine multiple sum ifs. So up here in our formula bar, we can type in the plus sign and then type sum ifs open parentheses now it's asking for our sum range which are the values that we want to actually sum which is the cells column then comma for the next argument and the criteria range the cells that we want evaluated is the region and then for the criteria for that region would be the north and then for the criteria range 2 is the month column comma and the criteria for that month column is October then we can close the parentheses and click enter and if you look at our totals between the two functions they are an exact match but hopefully you realize that depending on what your needs are can determine which function you need to use. For this case, it was a lot less complicated and more efficient to use the dsum function instead of adding two sum if functions together. And just by looking at this formula, we can tell that it took a lot more time to write this formula and to figure out how we could calculate the total that we were looking for. So keep in mind, when you are working inside of Excel, there's always going to be multiple ways to achieve the value that you are looking for. Now, some ways are more efficient than others, but it's very important to know how to use Excel efficiently because you can save a lot of time and increase your workflow. All right, so before we move on to the next section, there is one more function that I want to discuss, which is the subtotal function. Now, earlier in the course, we discuss how we could sort and group a column and then use the subtotal command. But the subtotal function is a little bit more versatile. And let me show you what I mean by that. So to start off, I'm going to insert a few rows here at the top of our spreadsheet to add some space for our subtotal. So I'm going to select row one, then use the Excel shortcut key, control plus or command plus if you're on Mac, to insert some rows. And then right above the last name column header, I'm going to put a label saying total sales. And then in the cell right next to it is where we will place our subtotal function. So to insert our function, we need to start off by typing in the equal sign. And then we can start typing our function name. So sub 
Then I'm going to double click the subtotal function. And right off the bat, we can tell that this function is a little bit different than others. This function is providing us a drop down list of many other different functions. So let's click the FX button to open up our function arguments window. And the first argument is the function num, which is, is the number 1 to 11 that specifies the summary function for the subtotal. Well, based off this definition, we know that this argument needs a number. But which number? Well, if you ever don't quite understand how to use the function or what's a place in the arguments, you can always click on help on this function. So we are going to give this a click and it will open up a Microsoft help link. And this will give you all the ins and outs of the subtotal function. And if we scroll down to the syntax, it provides all the numbers that the function num argument can receive. And it says numbers 1 through 11 includes manually hidden rows, while numbers 101 through 111 excludes them. And filtered out cells are always excluded. And once we get the subtotal function in our spreadsheet, I will show you what it means that it excludes filtered out cells. But let's say in our spreadsheet that we want to sum the total amount of cells we would need to use the sum function. Well, the sum function within the subtotal function is number nine, but the subtotal function can calculate the average, the count, the max, min, and so on. So it does a lot more than just summing. But for this example, we are trying to sum a range of cells. So for our function num argument, we need to insert a nine. So let's get back to our spreadsheet. And for the first argument, we can put a nine. And for the second argument, we can select the range of cells that we want to sum, which is the entire cells column. And this time, instead of clicking on the first cell and dragging down, because if you had thousands of records, it's a little bit time consuming to drag all the way down. So what we can do is use an Excel shortcut key. So let's click in the first cell of the cells column and then press on your keyboard, control shift down arrow or command shift down arrow. And this will select all the cells within that column. And if we click OK, we get a total of $73,630. I'm going to apply the accounting format to match our other values within our cells column. So this is the subtotal function. Well, you might be thinking, why couldn't we just use the regular sum function? Well, let me show you what the main difference is. So here we used the subtotal function and next to it, we will use the sum function. I'm just putting labels here so we know which function is which. So next to our subtotal function, let's insert the sum function. So we can type in the equal sign, sum, give the sum function a double click, select the cells that we want to sum, close parentheses, and click enter. And we get a total of 73,630 the same as what the subtotal gave us. But where the subtotal function has the upper hand is when we actually apply filters to our data. So let's say we only want to look at the total cells for the north region. Well, we can click our drop down arrow, deselect all the check boxes, and then check the north region. And if we click OK, look what happened to our values. The subtotal function is now giving us a total of 19,219 and our sum function stayed at 73,630. The reasoning behind this is because that the subtotal function excludes out filtered data and the sum function does not. So if you're wanting your formulas to act more dynamic, it's important to know that some functions like the subtotal function has these kind of features. 
and we can utilize these types of functions to make our spreadsheets more effective. So try it out. Instead of summing within the subtotal function, try to calculate an average or a count or whatever because the subtotal function can do a lot more than just sum. All right, so for this section of the course, we will be learning all about Excel data validation. And before we begin to apply some data validation to our spreadsheets, I want to discuss what Excel data validation is and what it's used for. Data validation is to restrict the type of data or the values that users can enter into a cell. So we have control over what users can input into the cells of our spreadsheet. And really quickly, I will show you where we can find data validation within Excel and what kind of control we have over the values that users can input. So data validation can be located underneath the data tab. And within the data tools group, we can select data validation. And within this window, we have access to different settings, input messages, and error alerts. And if we click this dropdown, we are provided with many different options of what we can control that the user inputs into our spreadsheet. So for example, if we only wanted to allow the user to insert a date value, we could select date. But we will touch more on these in the next few videos. The main point that I'm trying to get across is that Excel data validation is critical for reporting accuracy, filtering, sorting, and so on. It keeps consistency throughout our spreadsheet. So before showing a few examples of when data validation is critical and how it actually saves time, I want to point out that we will be working inside the data validation sheet tab. So make sure you have this tab selected and then we can start adding some data validation to our spreadsheet. All right, now that we know that data validation helps us control what can be entered into our spreadsheet, now let's actually apply some data validation to this little table here. So we have date in the first column, first name, last name, region, zip code, and age. Now the first type of data validation that I want to introduce to you is a drop-down list. Creating drop-down lists is one of the more common types of data validation that we use in Excel. And by using drop-down lists, it makes data entry a lot easier, reduce input errors and typing mistakes. And this helps a lot with reporting accuracy. So if we look at our table, which column would be a good fit to have a drop-down list for? Well, the date column would not be that good of a fit because there would be so many dates within our drop-down list. And the first name, last name, zip code, and age can vary quite a bit, so you would have a huge drop-down list. So for this example, we will be applying a drop-down list within the region column. So to apply data validation to a cell, the first thing that we have to do is to select the cell that we want to apply the data validation to. So let's click in cell E3, and then we can come up to the data tab and select data validation. Now to create a drop-down list, we have to click this drop-down arrow and select list. But we have to tell Excel what to include in our list. So that's what this source box is. In here we can start typing what we want to include in our list. Let's just use the same regions that we have been working with, which is north. And to separate the values, we have to put a comma. And then we can do south, comma, west, and east. And if we click OK, and if you notice, there's a little drop down arrow that showed up in our cell. And if we give that a click, we have our four options, north, south, west, or east region. We can select any one of these and it will input it into the cell. So if I select west, now west is in that cell. And if I try to input anything else other than those four options, it will give me an error. For example, if I did Midwest, 
and click enter, I get an error message saying, this value doesn't match the data validation restrictions defined for this cell. So once again, this really helps with reporting accuracy because we are controlling what the user can input into our spreadsheet. Now if I click cancel, it will put the last value that I had in that cell. Now let's go back to data validation and take a look at our source again. So if we click data validation, here in our source, we manually had to write in these values to include them in the dropdown list. Well, sometimes it might not be just four items. We could have 20 to 50 items within our dropdown list and editing the values within this source box can be a little tedious. So instead of actually typing these values in the source box, we can pull values from our spreadsheet itself. So let's walk through on how to do that. We can click cancel to get out of this. And then somewhere in our workbook, either on this spreadsheet or another spreadsheet, we can start entering the values that we want in our dropdown list. I'm just going to come over to column L and then start typing in my values into these cells. So we have north, south, west, and east. All right, now that we got these values in place, we can click our cell again, go back up to data validation, move this window a little bit so we can see our values, clear out our source box, and all we have to do is select the cells in our spreadsheet that have our values in them. So we can come over here, select our cells, and click OK. Now if we take a look at our drop-down list, it still has all of our values. And the neat thing about this is if we change one of these values where our data validation is pulling from, it will update our drop-down list. For example, instead of north, we can put north east. And if I click enter, come back to our drop-down list, now our drop-down list includes North East. I'm going to undo that action by pressing Control Z as in zebra. Now there's one other way that we can pull values from our spreadsheet to include in our drop-down list, which is creating a named range. So to create a named range, all we have to do is select the cells that we want to include in our name range, then come up to the name box next to our formula bar and give it a name. And let's type in regions. Click enter. Now those four cells have a name of regions. So if we go back to our cell where our dropdown list is, then come up to data validation, instead of the source being L3 through L6, we can just type in the equal sign and then type in our named range, which is regions. And if we click OK and take a look at our drop-down list, our regions are still there. So depending on your needs, there are multiple ways to include values in our drop-down list. And if I have the values on the same sheet where our data validation is pulling from, I like to hide that column because those values can be a little bit distracting. Because if a user opens up this spreadsheet and then sees these values, they're going to wonder why those values are there. And ultimately, they might come in and mess up the items that we need to be included in our drop-down list. So what I like to do is select the column that we have our values in, give this column a right click, and hide the column. Even though that the column is hidden, if we come back to our drop-down list, our values are still there. So that's how you create an Excel drop-down list using data validation. All right, now that we have discussed how we can create a drop-down list using data validation, now we are going to go over a few other types of data validation. So let's begin with the date column. So the first thing that we have to do is select the cell that we want to apply the data validation to, which is cell B3. Then go up to the data tab and select data validation. And this time, Instead of selecting list from our dropdown, let's select date. 
And from here, we can control what date values the user can input. Our first option is to allow values between two separate dates. Or if we click this drop down, we are presented with many other different options where we can only allow date values equal to, not equal to, greater than, less than, and so on. But for this example, we will stick with between. So for the start date, we can put in January 1st of 2020. And then for the end date, we can put in December 31st of 2021. And if we click OK, it doesn't look like anything has happened. But if we try to enter a date value outside of that date range that we specified, it will give us an error. For example, if I did May 25th of 2019, so this date is before January 1st of 2020, if I click enter, we get an error saying this value doesn't match the data validation restrictions. And if we click retry and put a date value within that date range, so maybe April 19th of 2021 and click enter, that date works because that date value is between January 1st of 2020 and December 31st of 2021. So that's a date data validation. Another column that we could apply data validation to is the zip code, because usually zip codes are in a five digit format or a five digit dash four digit format. So if we had users inputting data into this spreadsheet, we would want to make sure that the zip code is formatted correctly and prevent any errors while entering the data. So let's click inside cell F3, then click on data validation. And then in our drop down menu, we can select text length. And just for this example, let's say that all the zip codes that we input into the spreadsheet will be a five digit format. So the text length would have to be equal to five. So in our first option, instead of it being between a certain text length, let's select this drop down and then click on equal to. And then for the length, we could put five. And if we click OK, and if we put in a zip code of 78542, we don't get an error message because that zip code has five digits. But if we accidentally came in and put a six digit zip code, we would get the error message. So this really helps to prevent users from accidentally inputting the wrong data. We can click cancel. And just as one more example, we could apply data validation to the age. So let's select cell G3, come up to data validation. And this time in our drop down list, we can select whole number because an age won't have a decimal, right? So let's select whole number. And let's say that everybody within this spreadsheet should be greater than or equal to the age of 18. So we can select our data drop down arrow. So we only want to allow the age to be greater than or equal to 18. So we can come down here and select greater than or equal to. And then for our minimum box, we can put 18. And if we click OK, and if we insert 19, we don't get an error message. If we put 18, we still don't get an error message because it's greater than or equal to. But if we put 17, we should get the error message. And there it is. So those are a few types of data validation that you can apply to your spreadsheet. And as you can tell, it can really help control what the user can input into your spreadsheet. In the next lecture, I will be discussing how we can add custom messages and alerts to help guide the users to know what to put into the cells. Because if you have data validation in place in your spreadsheet, and if a user tries to input a value and get an error message, they might be confused as to why not they can't insert that value.
So that's where the custom messages and alerts come into place. Okay, so now that we have some data validation rules applied in our spreadsheet, now we can add custom alerts and messages to our data validation to help guide users to know what values that these cells can contain. For example, let's change the date in the date column. And let's say that we put in a date that doesn't fit our data validation rules. We get an error message. But this error message is not very specific. And the user might be confused why they can't put this date value in this cell. But we can add custom alerts to notify the user what these cells can contain. So let's cancel out of this and make sure that we have our cell selected. Come up to the data tab and select data validation. Now in the previous video, we worked underneath the settings tab, but we also have these other two tabs to add custom messages and alerts. So let's start with the input message tab. What the input message does is that once a user clicks a cell that contains a data validation rule, a little message box will pop up. And inside this message box, we can give a brief description of what these cells can contain or provide any guidance that can help the user. For example, we know that in our date column that this cell can only contain a date value. So maybe in this message box, we can tell the user what kind of format we want the date to be in. We can give our message box a title and I'm just going to put date. And then for our input message, maybe we can say, please enter date in mm slash dd slash yyyy format. And if we click OK, and if the user selects this cell, it shows our message box. Please enter date in this format. And if we click a different cell, that message box will go away. And if we click it again, it will pop back up. So that's how we can put input messages for our data validation rules. So this input message tells us what format to put the date in. But if we still put in a date that's not within our range, we will still get that same error message. But we can change that error message to be more descriptive. So let's come back up to the data validation button, select the error alert tab, and then from here, we can put an error message. So for the title, I'm just gonna put date again. And for the error message, we can say, please enter a date between January 1st, 2020 dash December 31st, 2021. And if we click OK, so now if we enter a date outside of that range, so let's say we put August 7th of 2018, now our error message shows the title, which is date, and then our message, please enter a date between January 1st of 2020 and December 31st of 2021. So this is a lot more descriptive than just Excel saying that your value does not fit the data validation rules. Let's do another one for the zip code. So we can cancel out of this, then click our cell in the zip code column, come up to the data validation button, and for the title, we could put zip code, and for the error message, we can say, please enter a five digit zip code. And if we click OK, and if we try to enter a nine digit zip code with the dash followed by four other digits and click enter, Excel says, please enter a five digit zip code and we can click retry and only enter the five digits. So pretty simple to do, but very helpful. Now, instead of adding an error message, we can add a warning message. 
So let me show you the differences between the two. If we click the cell in our age column, come back up to data validation, and currently for this error alert, our style is stop, meaning that we can only retry to get the correct value within the cell or cancel. But if we click this drop down and select warning, now the user has an option to override the data validation rule. For example, let's put a title here. I'm just going to put age. And for the error message, we can put age should be greater than or equal to 18. And if we click OK, now if we come back up to our cell and change the age to 16, now instead of the red X, we get the yellow warning sign. And it says that age should be greater than or equal to 18. And then it also asks us if we wish to continue. And if we select yes, we will override the data validation rule and put 16 in this cell. So if we click yes, now 16 is in that cell, even though our rule states that it should be greater than or equal to 18. But instead of having a stop message in place, we have a warning message. And with the warning message, the user can't continue to put any value within this cell. So that's how you add custom messages and alerts with Excel data validation. And it can really help guide users to know what these cells can or cannot contain. All right, now that we have built a solid foundation with data validation, with being able to create drop down lists, apply different data validation rules, error alerts, input messages, and so on, now I'm going to show you how we can create a dynamic drop down list. Meaning that if our drop down list is pulling values from cells within the workbook, and if we add to that range of cells, our drop down list will add those values automatically. So, really quickly, let's create a drop down list within this yellow cell to where we can select one of these fruits. Now, we have done this before, but what we have to do is select the cell that we want our drop down list to be, come up to the Data tab, click Data Validation, and underneath the Settings tab, we can use this drop down to select list and for the source, we can select the fruit column. And if we click OK, now we have a drop down list that includes the fruit. If we add a fruit to our range of cells, so let's say the new item number is six and we add grape. Now, if we come back to our drop down list, Grape does not get included in the drop down list. So let me show you how we can make this drop down list more dynamic. So let's remove grape from our range of cells. And the first thing that we have to do is convert our range of cells to a table. So we need to select our cells, come up to the insert tab, and select table. And our table has headers, so we can click OK. All right, now that we have converted our range to a table, and if we add grape again to this table, so item number six, grape, and we check our drop down list again, now grape is included in our drop down list. Before we converted our range to a table, our source for our drop down list was from cells C3 through C7. But now, if we go back and take a look at our source, now our source is saying C3 through C8. So that's another advantage of converting your data into a table because since we added a row to our table, it also added a row to our drop down list source. So this is how you can take Excel data validation to the next level. 
and by making your spreadsheets more dynamic, it will save you a lot of time and ultimately increase your efficiency. Okay, so the reason why I wanted to show you how to create a dynamic drop-down list in the previous video was to kind of prepare you on how to create a dependent drop-down list, meaning that we can change the items in our drop-down list based on another cell's value. So a little warning, this one is a little bit more tricky than creating a dynamic drop-down list, but this is also very useful. So I want to show you that way you can have it and refer back to this video if you ever have to create a dependent drop-down list. So let's take a look at our setup here. For our source, we have fruits in one column and vegetables in another. Our goal is to be able to select fruits or vegetables for the category cell and depending on which category we choose, we'll change the drop-down list in the food column to include the items for that category. So our first step is to convert our data into a table. So that way, if we add any items to our table, it will also add it to our drop-down list. So let's select our data, and then come up to the Insert tab, and select Table. And check that My Table has headers, and click OK. Now let's create a drop-down list for our category column. So we can click inside cell B3, come up to the Data tab, and select Data Validation. Then we can select our drop-down and allow from a list. And for our source, we can select our table headers because for our category, we want to be able to select fruits or vegetables. So we can go ahead and select these headers and press OK. So now in our category drop-down list, we have fruits or vegetables. Now the next step is to create a name range for our table columns. Let's start with the fruits column. What we need to do is select all the cells within the fruits column. And then from here, we can go up to the name box and type in a name, or we can go to the formulas tab and select define name. We have to name this range exactly how it's spelled in the category column so either fruits or vegetables. But since we're doing the fruits column, we need to type in fruits. And we can tell that this name range refers to table four, which is the name of the table on this worksheet, and it includes the fruits column. We can click OK. Now we have to do the same thing to the vegetables column. So we need to select all the cells in the vegetables column come back up to the Formulas tab and click Define Name. And remember, the name has to be an exact match to what's in our Category column. And since we're in the Vegetables column, we have to name it Vegetables. And once again, we could see that it refers to Table 4 and includes the Vegetables column. And then we can click OK. Now it's time to create a drop-down list for the food column. Now before we create this drop-down list, I do want to mention that we will be using a new function, which is called the indirect function. And what the indirect function does is that it accepts text values and evaluates them as cell references. Just as a quick example, I'm going to click in any blank cell on this worksheet. And then I'm going to insert the indirect function. So equals indirect. Now, like I said, the indirect function accepts text values and then evaluates them as cell references. So for text values, we had to put quotation marks. And if I put B3, close quotation marks, then close parentheses, Watch what this function gives us. If I click enter, it gave us the value of vegetables. Well, now you might be thinking, why couldn't we just type in equals and then click cell B3? 
to get vegetables as well. Well, you got to remember, inside of our indirect function, we didn't just click cell B3. B3 was a text value, not a cell reference, because we put it in quotation marks. But the function evaluated that text value as a cell reference. Well, the power of the indirect function can map text to a named range. So let me show you how we can utilize the indirect function to create a dependent dropdown list. And hopefully you can get a better understanding what the indirect function actually does. So I'm going to clear out these cells and then click the cell in the food column, come up to the data tab and select data validation. And then we can select our dropdown and then choose list. And now for our source, this is where we will use the indirect function. So let's type in the equal sign and then type in indirect open parentheses. And then from here, we can select cell B3 because the items in this list depend on what category we choose. And then we can close the parentheses. So I know this could be a little bit confusing, but basically using the indirect function in our source is allowing us to reference a named range. Now previously, when we created our first dropdown list, I showed you multiple options that we can use as our source. The first option was to manually type in the items, separating them by a comma, or we could select a range of cells within the workbook. And the last option was to create a named range for a group of cells and then use that name in our source. So that's basically what it's doing here. Right now, this source is telling us that it's equal to vegetables. And after we converted our range of cells to a table, we created a name range for each column. One was fruits and one was vegetables. So depending on what we choose in our category column, our source will change to either fruits or vegetables. So let's click OK and see it in action. So if we come up here in our drop-down list, currently the category is vegetables, so the items in our drop-down list are vegetables. We got avocado, bell pepper, carrot, corn, potato. Now if we change our category to fruits, now our dependent drop-down list has apple, banana, mango, pear, and pineapple, which are the values in the fruits column. And since that we have our range of cells converted into a table, if we add to this table, let's say for fruits, we put grape, and for vegetables, we put tomato. If we go back to our dependent drop-down list, now grape is added to the list. And if we change our category to vegetables, now tomato is added to the list. So that's how you can create a dependent drop-down list. I know it was kind of a lot, and it might take you a few times to actually get it down, but as you can see, this is a very powerful and dynamic functionality that you can add to your spreadsheets and increase your productivity.